All right. All right. Okay. You have probably heard this name before because Vampire Academy was a very popular book series back in the late aughts and early 2010s. It was basically everywhere for a while. Like, even in the sea of vampire-related stuff that was coming out after Twilight came out and got really popular, Vampire Academy still stood out from the pack because it was all over the place. I saw it at the libraries, I saw it at the bookstores, people at school were reading it, my younger sister read it. At my copy actually says, new series on Peacock. So much for that. Now, they've tried adapting it twice, and they failed twice. They made a movie way back in 2014, and they made a Peacock show more recently, which, again, was canceled after a single season. The movie... I, like, I haven't seen the show, so I can't say anything about it. The movie, on the other hand, is bad, but it's funny bad. You know, it's a combination of, like, bad dialogue, bad acting, and weird directing choices that just make it really, really fun to watch. I like your laugh. Singular, not plural. It's the first time I've heard it. So, uh, have any other moves you want to show me? The point I'm making, though, is that the books have enough of a fan base that they were able to get it adapted twice, which is not something that happens very often. Even I read the first book <clears throat> way back in the day. I mean, I only read the first book. I didn't go past that until now. And actually, it was my sister's copy that I borrowed to read, so... It's her fault this video exists. Uh, it's also her fault the Red Queen video exists. So thank her or curse her, depending on how you feel. But I have now read all six Vampire Academy books. I haven't read any of the spin-offs or anything, so don't come at me if I leave out details from those. Uh, but I can now tell you what happens in the main series so that you don't have to read them, because trust me, while these books are not that bad, they're not worth reading, you know? I'd say overall they're okay, it's just not worth the effort to put into them. Because, I mean, honestly, the name Vampire Academy, it, like, it sounds fake. It sounds like a fake book series. Like a joke from an episode of The Simpsons. Like, oh, Dad, can you drive me to the store? I want to buy the new Vampire Academy book. Like, that, that sounds like a thing that it, would, uh, that it would be. But, no, it's real. The books are completely real. They are about a teenage girl named Rose who goes to a magic school full of vampires. And she's not a chosen one or anything, she's actually a bodyguard for her best friend, whose name is Lyssa, and Lyssa is the last member of an old, prestigious royal family. And she also has cool powers that no one else has. So in, in a lot of other book series, Lyssa would probably be the protagonist and Rose would just be the sidekick, so focusing on Rose is actually a pretty unique choice. And I just want to say up front that as much criticism as I have here, Vampire Academy isn't bad. You know, the characters have real heart to them. When Rose acts stupid, it makes sense for her character to act that way. And when she does something dumb, like I was thinking to myself, okay, that's dumb, but it's also definitely something that Rose would do. And there's also just... There's an undeniable earnestness to everyone's interactions. You know, major characters, minor characters, whenever they're interacting with each other, it just feels very real. You know, you feel like these people are friends, they do care about each other, and they really do want to help each other any way they can. Or they're just strangers who pass through each other's lives briefly, and even then, there is something there. You know, it, we're, we're all shaped by interactions we have with people around us, whether they're big or small. And it's kind of nice to see an author acknowledge that. There are some moments scattered throughout the books of gripping action and real terror. And the, some of the world building is actually pretty smart. The writing style has personality without being obnoxious, you know, because it's told in Rose's first person point of view. But we also see into her friend Lissa's head sometimes. We'll, we'll get to that later, don't worry. And it, Rose has a few jokes and sarcastic quips mixed in there, but not too many. You know, a, a lot of authors try to give their protagonist personality by doing that, and it just comes across not great. It, it, in Vampire Academy, it feels like the way a real teenager would really describe some of these situations. But at the same time, the books have some very serious issues that made them hard to get through. Like, a huge chunk of time is spent on Rose's love life, and while sometimes that does work, it gets really distracting. Not to mention the very odd opinion that these books have on statutory rape. We'll get to that later, but just just know, it's coming. I, I, didn't, I didn't miss it. It's coming. 
The books also don't have any antagonist or even an overarching conflict, really. Like, there are smaller conflicts that go throughout the series, but there's very little holding it all together, so it's kind of hard for me to say exactly what it's about in summary. Uh, there's no main villain to, you know, focus our attention on and make us feel like we gotta take that guy down or we gotta stop him from doing what he's trying to do. When I reached the end of the books, I didn't feel like a great obstacle had been overcome or we'd reached the end of a long journey. I just thought, oh, okay, I guess, I guess that's it then. And my god, do the last three books drag on. Like, here's the first three books and here's the last three. You can see on, on the camera, on the screen right now, you can see how much thicker these are. And I don't know why they decided to do that. I just, I don't know why they did that. Because the first three books, they, they have one plot structure. It's where it's like 80% character development and interaction and teenage drama stuff, which sounds a bit worse than it really is. The teenage drama stuff's actually pretty good. Uh, and then in the climax, it'll be like, oh, we, we have an action climax now and the action climax are the best parts of the first three books. And then books four, five, and six have like one plot that just goes throughout, and you would think that works better, and in some ways it does, but really it's the same amount of plot that the first three books all had, just stretched out to be a longer book. And while Rose, the protagonist, isn't a chosen one, or otherwise the center of the world, she still feels like she's everybody's main priority, especially in the last book. And there are a lot of good ideas that get brought up and never really explored throughout the series. Like, you'll, you'll see as we go on, there's some stuff that gets brought up and it sounds cool, but then they don't really do anything with it. So, overall, I wouldn't recommend reading the Vampire Academy books unless you really, really love the Harry Potter-esque idea of, like, a hidden magical world where kids go to a magic school. And if you want more of that, I guess Vampire Academy will scratch that itch for you. So Vampire Academy, it's not awful, but it's not worth reading either. And that's why I'm here to summarize it very briefly. And uh, that's the end of the intro. Spoilers ahead. Let's go. So the first thing that you're going to have to know about Vampire Academy is that it is about vampires. Shocking, I know. There are three types of vampires. There's Moroi, Dampier, and Strigoi. Now, Moroi are the main ones, and in order to be a Moroi, you have to be born one. You can't get turned into one. So, you have to have two Moroi that made a child. That's how you are, can become a Moroi. They are sensitive to sunlight, and it weakens them, but it won't kill them. They don't burst into flames as soon as they step out in the sun. They do have to drink blood in addition to eating regular food, and they are also the only type of vampires that have magic, so they can heal and throw fireballs and stuff. They're described as being extremely tall and skinny, like kind of weak physically for the most part. Like Rose mentions that to the trained eye, she can almost instantly tell whether someone is a Maroi or a Dampier just from looking at them. And then there are Strigoi. Now Strigoi are a lot more like standard vampires. You know, they burn up if they touch sunlight, they have red eyes, pale skin. They are sociopathic, they kill people when they feed on them usually. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. Strigoi are also way stronger than regular vampires, and they're hard to kill because they're sort of dead and sort of alive at the same time. You know, they, they have to be either decapitated or stabbed in the heart with a silver stake. And when I say silver stake, I don't mean a stake made of silver, I mean a specific magical stake that's been enchanted by Moroi. Also, I'm sorry I keep scratching my nose. The thing is, my voice is so deep that it kind of vibrates on the inside and makes it itch. I apologize. Now, Strigoi can't enter holy places like churches or mosques, but crosses and holy water and other stuff don't really seem to do anything to them. It's implied, they don't come right out and say it, but it is implied that Strigoi are the source of the myth of vampires in the human world. Like, humans saw Strigoi at some point and that's where the stories come from. Now, you can't be born a Strigoi, you have to become one. And there are two ways to become one. If you're a Moroi, then you just feed on someone until they die, and that will turn you into a Strigoi. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. And if you are a human or a Dampier, then you can be turned Strigoi by feeding on the blood of a Strigoi. And there are a lot of Strigoi spread throughout the story, but most of them are only important for a little bit, and then they're killed off or otherwise they have to leave, and so they can't all get a picture. So they will all be represented by this picture of the Count from Sesame Street. 
Now, the third and final type of vampire, the kind that Rose is, is a dampier. Now, a dampier is what happens when a moroi and a human have a baby, or a moroi and a dampier have a baby. Like, dampier themselves are sterile, they can't have kids with humans, and they can't have kids with other dampier, but they can have them with moroi. However, if a dampier and a moroi have a baby, the baby will always be a dampier. Now, dampier are less sensitive to sun, they don't have magic, and they don't ever drink blood. But they're also more physically robust and stronger than moroi. Now, like I said, dampier can only have kids with moroi, so they kind of rely on them to continue existing. And at the same time, strigoi really love f tracking down and feeding on moroi because they're magic, so feeding on them makes them more powerful. So dampier are, in this society, pretty much always serve as moroi guardians. They train their whole lives to fight strigoi. Really, they're, they're all very much servants for the moroi. Like, moroi are the ones with all the money and the power, and moroi are expected to procreate with other moroi, but sometimes moroi men will have flings with dampier women. Uh, it very rarely happens the other way around. Uh, but this results in a lot of children born out of wedlock who don't know their fathers. Uh, the dampier are a very much a single mom society. And that brings me to the protagonist. Her name is Rosemary Hathaway, or Rose for short. She is a 17-year-old dampier. She turns 18 partway through the books, but she's 17 at the beginning. Uh, and she has trained to be a guardian her whole life. Her mom is a dampier, and she doesn't know who her dad is. At the beginning, she knows he was a Moroi, she knows he was Turkish, and because he was Turkish, she thinks that he was most likely Muslim, but that's all she knows for certain. Now, Rose went to school at St. Vladimir's Academy. That is an academy for vampires. Not the only academy for vampires, but just one of them. And it is magically hidden in Montana. If you're not American, there's fucking nothing in Montana. There's a good, that's a good place to hide a place. But yeah, it's magically enchanted so that number one, Strigoi can't get in and also humans won't wander across it. And that's where the Moroi and Dampier go to be safe from Strigoi and learn to use magic and stuff, which sounds kind of familiar. Now, St. Vladimir's has kids from kindergarten up through the end of high school, which is about ages five to 18. And Rose, back to her, she is tough, headstrong, and has a tendency to rush into situations without thinking it through, and she would do pretty much anything to help her friends. When she does dumb stuff, which she does frequently, there is usually a thread of logic to it, and it does make sense for her character. Unlike the last couple of very brief summaries I've done, Rose, the protagonist, has an actual personality <laughs> this time. It's kind of strange how rare that is, but... Uh, yeah, Rose has an actual personality, so she will be played by Zoe Deutsch, who also played her in the movie. Now, next is her best friend, Vasilisa Dragomir, who is usually just called Lissa for short. Now, Moroi are hidden from the human world, and they are ruled by a king or queen. Now, the monarchs seem ceremonial at times, but they are in charge of keeping everyone safe from Strigoi, and in charge of uh, how the guardians are distributed, things like that. And they also enforce the laws. You know, the Moroi have their own prison, and sometimes they execute people for committing certain crimes. The Moroi monarchy isn't hereditary. They choose their monarch from among 12 royal families. Uh, they're all either Russian or Romanian in descent. There's actually a fair bit of Russian culture in these books. It's kind of nice, you know, makes them different. Uh, but what is odd to me is that even though the royal families of Moroi are all Russian or Romanian, not all Moroi are Russian or Romanian. Like I said, uh, Rose's dad is Turkish and he's a Moroi, and there's others from all over the world. So I'm not sure how the Russian and Romanian royal families took over the others, but whatever. Anyways, uh, the leader of a royal family is a prince or princess, which is usually given to the oldest member of the family. Lissa is only 17, but she's already a princess because she is the last of the Dragomir family. Yeah, a few years before the story starts, there was a bad car crash, and Lissa's parents and her older brother were all killed. Now, Rose was hurt pretty bad too, but Lissa was able to heal her because she has magic healing powers that no one else does. And they don't understand it, but ever since that incident, the two of them have a magical psychic bond of some sort. Like, Lissa can't see Rose's thoughts, but Rose can see Lissa's thoughts and enter her mind and know what she's thinking and feeling. Lissa also has some pretty serious mental problems, which we will get into a little bit more later. But basically, she has these bouts of rage and depression that consume her for long periods of time. And it would be really funny if she was played by Lisa Simpson, so that's who I'm putting here. 
And every time I accidentally call her Lisa instead of Lissa, feel free to take a shot. Now, about two years before the story begins, Rose and Lissa ran away from school, and they have been living alone on the run ever since. And remember, they're, they're teenagers. They're minors. It's kind of a big deal that they did this. And they were terrified of what others might do if they found out about Lissa's healing powers. That, that's why they ran. And we'll get into more detail about that as the story goes on. Uh, now, like I said, Lissa is the last of the Dragomir line, but she does still have distant relatives who are members of other royal families due to hundreds of years of intermarriage. One of them is her uncle, really a distant cousin, called Viktor Dashkov. Or, I, I think in Russian it would be pronounced Dashkov, but I'm not sure. Feel free to correct me on that. Now, Victor has a genetic disease which is called Sandowski's Syndrome. Uh, Moroi are immune to most diseases, but genetic ones do still get them sometimes. Uh, basically, Sandowski's Syndrome means Victor is in his 40s and he's already close to death. You know, his hair is gray and thinning out, Mo many of his organs are failing, he has to walk with a cane. Yeah, he's, he's not doing well. He is aged and unhealthy and constantly gets outsmarted, but he still thinks he's a genius far beyond anyone else, so he'll be played by Jordan Peterson. Normally, I would go into more detail about other relevant characters and important parts of the setting, but that would be way too much front-loading right now, trust me. Believe me, all of these people on the wall, this is not everybody. Like, we're gonna have to remove some and replace them as we go, because this just that there's not enough space for everyone. Uh, this series brings in new people all the time, many of whom seem irrelevant until two or three books later. There, there are dozens to keep track of, so we'll just bring them up as they become important. For all the other young characters who I mentioned who aren't really important enough to warrant their own pictures, here's a picture of some generic high school students that I'll gesture to. And for all the adults that aren't important enough to warrant their own pictures, who are usually guardians, uh, here's some school cops. And that's it. Spoilers ahead. So we start with Book 1, Vampire Academy. It begins with Lyssa having a nightmare, and Rose feels it and wakes her up to comfort her. Lyssa is hungry, so she drinks a little bit of Rose's blood. M now, Moroi can drink blood from humans or Dampier, but they can't drink it from other Moroi. It does also feel really, really good for the person being fed on. Like, it releases happy chemicals, and sometimes people can even get addicted to it after a while. Rose notices a man standing in the yard, and she tells Lyssa, Hey, someone's coming for us. We need to go. She's worried it might be a Strigoi at first, but don't worry, it's not. Now, Lyssa uses compulsion on their roommate, whose name is Jeremy, and they steal his car. Now, Moroi can use magic compulsion to force people to do things for them uh, and mind control people, but Lyssa is way stronger than most people in that regard. That's how they convinced people to let them you know, live with them. That's how two minors are able to be on the run and not be homeless. So as they're leaving and going to the car, more men surround them, and Rose realizes, okay, these aren't Strigoi, these are Dampir, they're, they're guardians. Rose attacks one, she fails horribly and gets knocked down. And one of them, after they subdue the girls, he says his name is Dmitri, and he's there to take them back to the academy. Now, Dmitri Belikov, or Belikov, uh, is Russian, like he's actually from Russia. He's described as being over six and a half feet tall and impossibly gorgeous, like every other page. Uh, he's in his mid-twenties and already one of the most accomplished Guardians ever. In the movie, they describe him as a combat god. They say Dimitri is a god. Well, I'm an atheist. An atheist with a big gun. God, I love that line. It's like... <laughs> easily. That, that line is easily one of the worst I've ever heard in any movie, but I just love it so much. It's so stupid. Now, because Dimitri is described as being really large and muscular all the time, He'll be portrayed by Alan Richson without a shirt on. Now, the girls get taken into a jet and flown away. Later, they land and then drive to the Academy, which, like I said, is out in the middle of nowhere in Mon Montana. It's St. Vladimir's Academy. It's a school for vampires. You might even call it a vampire academy. So they go and talk to the headmistress, whose name is Kirova. And they walk through the middle of everyone in the middle of the school day, and people are stopping and staring at them, because they're like, oh, hey, those are the girls that ran away a couple years ago. They're back. That's crazy. And Lissa's uncle, Viktor Dashkov, Dashkov, I don't know, I'll probably go back and forth on that, uh, is there, and he's actually really happy to see, that, to, er, see them, and they are happy to see him. He's actually a super nice guy, and ever since Lissa's parents have died, he's been there for her the best he can. Now, Headmistress Karova chews the two of them out. She says that Rose was irresponsible and derelict in her duty to protect Lissa, which 
yeah, that's, uh, that, that's true. It, it's 100% true. Like I said, Ro Rose runs into danger a lot, but others point out what, that what she's doing is stupid, so it's not like the books give her a pass on everything. Also, you do, you're going to want to hear this line. I might have been raised in the U.S., but my parents were foreign-born. My damn pure mother was Scottish, red-haired with a ridiculous accent, and I'd been told my Moroi dad was Turkish. That genetic combination had given me the skin the same color as the inside of an almond, along with what I like to think were semi-exotic desert princess features. Big dark eyes and hair so deep brown that it usually looked black. I wouldn't have minded inheriting the red hair, but we take what we can get. That is an interesting way for a white woman to describe her main character. Now, Dimitri tells Kirova about the psychic bond that Rose and Lissa have, and Kirova is kind of incredulous, but she does believe him, and she decides it would be best not to send Rose away. Because no one has ever heard of this bond, and they've never heard of it happening between anyone else either, and they, they don't know what'll happen to the two of them if they're separated. Kirova decides that the two of them will just re-enroll in school and start going back to class, and Rose will go back to training to be a guardian, and outside of her regular guardian training, she'll be tutored by Dimitri to help her catch up. So she attends regular novice guardian training, and all the novices like her, and she gets back into the swing of things pretty quickly. One of her friends there is also a Dampier novice guardian. His name is Mason. And a Mason is somebody who works on rocks, so he will be played by The Rock. Or Dwayne Johnson, if you prefer, but that sounds like an insurance salesman. Mason also has a friend named Eddie, and Eddie doesn't really do anything until book two, but he becomes important eventually, so here's his picture. Now, Rose is super out of practice at first. She's bad at combat stuff. And her teacher chides her and humiliates her in front of the class, basically telling her, you're an untrained idiot, and you could have died. And yeah, he's being kind of a jerk about it, but he is correct. Like, Rose is talented for her age, and she spends a lot of time practicing, but she ultimately did fail in her duty as a bodyguard. She brought Lyssa into danger. Strigoi could have found them, and they would have been helpless against them. The book doesn't chastise Rose for her mistakes too much, but... It does acknowledge her mistakes, and other characters react to them in reasonable ways. You know, a, a teenager did something dumb, and luckily no one got hurt. But at the same time, Rose doesn't quite grasp that what she did was dumb and wrong, so it matches the way a lot of teenagers really do act. It's just nice to read something where the character conflicts actually make sense, you know? The two of them also have a friend named Natalie. She's really nice, she's actually Victor Dashkov's daughter, and uh, that's kind of it. So here's Lindsay Lohan and Mean Girls. Also, uh, sorry, this one is all wrinkled. I accidentally threw it in the trash before I started filming. Now afterwards, Rose talks to Victor again, and she asks him about the psychic bond, which started about two years earlier, right after the car crash. Victor doesn't seem to know much about it, but he says he'll look into it for her. Now she sees another Moroi, whose name is Mia, bullying Lissa, and then Rose comes over, shoves her off, and they leave. Mia winds up being important through the whole end of the series, or at least somewhat important through the whole end of the series. I, I don't know, she, she gets her own picture at least. She's really small, she's a bit younger than the main cast, and she's just kind of a bitchy cheerleader type, always looking for popularity, so she'll be Regina George. So Lissa goes off to feed on somebody because they have a bunch of human volunteers at the academy, and like I said, when you feed on someone, it feels really good for them, and some people get addicted, so it's actually not that hard to find human volunteers to just come and live in this area so that they can be fed on regularly. Uh, and later, Lissa is relaxing in an isolated area, and a boy named Christian Ozera comes over to her. Now, Christian Ozera is kind of infamous because years ago, his parents w turned themselves Strigoi on purpose, and then they were killed later on after trying to turn her him Strigoi. Uh, and so because of that, everyone views him and his immediate family with suspicion. Now, Christian is an emo loner who dresses in all black and hangs out in an abandoned church attic, so who else could he be played by other than Gerard Way? See, like, it, it's tradition now. I have to put Gerard Way in all of these somehow. I think you're starting to understand why I didn't bring up all of these characters in the background section. That would have taken way too long. So, Lissa and Christian do bicker a bit, but they seem to get along okay. And he actually deduces that because there weren't any human feeders for Lissa out in the regular world, he realizes that okay, she must have fed on Rose's blood when she was hungry. And Lissa asks him not to say anything to anyone because it's considered kinky or dirty. Also, I should take a moment to mention that whenever Lissa is doing something and Rose isn't nearby, it's because Rose is actually going into her head and watching her do stuff. 
But yes, if you're a Dampier and you're allowing Moroi to feed on you, it's considered kinky, it's considered dirty, and they often derisively refer to people who volunteer for it as blood whores, which is also the term used for people who let themselves be fed on while they're having sex. Dimitri mentions to Rose that the only reason he's at the school teaching is because the Moroi he was guarding died, like they were killed by a Strigoi. And that causes Rose to think back to her old teacher, Miss Carp. Now, Miss Carp was at the academy with them. She was kind of nutty, clearly not all there mentally. She wandered around campus at night talking to herself. And one night, Rose fell and hurt herself, but Carp came over and healed her. She seemed to have the same magic healing powers that Lissa has. Now, Rose also, because her and Lissa are kept separated to make sure they don't do anything stupid again, uh, the, one of the only times that she can spend time with her is by going to church. And Rose is only vaguely religious. Most Moroi are Orthodox Christians. Rose just says, yeah, I guess I believe in God, but I don't care that much beyond that. And while they're at church, the priest mentions St. Vladimir, who is the school's patron saint, and he says he was friends with Shadow Kissed Anna. Now, St. Vladimir had mental issues kind of similar to Lissa's, which piques Rose's interest. Now, later as they're leaving, Mia splashes them with some magic water because she's a bitch. And when I say she splashes them with magic water, I mean she uses her magic to summon some water and throw it at them, not like special holy water that will burn their skin or anything. Now, Rose doesn't fight her though. She resists the urge to just punch her lights out. After that, Mason and Rose decide to work together to research St. Vladimir. They find an old book which says he and Anna were best buds. She guarded him and protected him when Satan's darkness tried to smother him. Uh, and it's also mentioned that he saved her life as a child. The book doesn't say what shadow kissed means, it just says that Anna was herself shadow kissed. However, Rose realizes that Anna and Saint Vladimir had a psychic bond similar to her and Lyssa. Now, like I said, Rose is out of practice, so in order to catch up to the other novices, she is training constantly and doing extra tutoring with Dimitri. So keep that in mind as we go forward. She actually has to work to get better at fighting. You know, she's, she's not just the best at the start. She doesn't have instant knowledge of some special unrivaled powers. You know, it, it would have been really easy for her later victories to feel unearned, but they don't. They make sense and I feel really happy for her. But anyways, the point is she's also developing a crush on Dimitri and he's 24 and she's 17 and his student. So he really isn't interested in her, you know, the way a normal, well-adjusted adult would act in that situation. Uh, and he's friendly with her, but he acts really aloof. And one day while they're training, Rose feels some danger coming from Lissa. She runs off to her dorm to see what's wrong, and she sees there's a dead fox on her bed. I feel like there's a joke about Disney buying fox here, but I can't think of it. Just come up with it on your own. Let me know in the comments about your dead fox joke. But yes, somebody just slit this fox's throat and left it there on her bed. And they aren't sure who, but they're clearly trying to mess with Lissa for one reason or another. Now Rose, while she's back at training, she starts getting a lot better at it and advancing really, really quickly. In one of their classes, a teacher explains how alpha males run wolf packs, which is not how it works. That is not how it works. Get over yourselves. And it doesn't really come up much in this book or in the later books, so I'm not sure why it's there. I thought it was going to be some sort of theme going forward, but it's not. So there's another student named Ralph who accuses Rose of killing the fox for attention. And so Christian sets him on fire. <laughs> Christian, cut it out. Now, it's really quick. It's him using magic because Christian is good with fire magic. So there's no injuries or anything. But he is still suspended for it, which... Yes, he should be suspended for it. Partially because you don't set people on fire without their permission. At least that's not how, how I was raised. I was raised better than that. And partially because just in general, using magic offensively is considered a huge taboo. You know, Moroi never fight. They have employees to do that for them. And because of this and other stuff, Rose tells Lissa that she shouldn't be hanging around Christian, but she does it anyways, and Rose spies on them via the mental bond, which seems like a th shitty thing to do, but Lissa never complains about it, so I guess it's consensual. Now, Christian says that Moroi should be training in offensive magic, and they should ignore the rules because the rules are dumb, which, yeah, I do agree with him. I just don't think he should be setting his fellow students on fire in class. And he also realizes that Lissa uses compulsion on people, which is impressive. Because like I said, 
They can all do it, sort of, but Lissa's is just way, way more powerful and instinctual than everyone else's. Now, Rose also goes at one point and makes out with another Maroi student named Jesse. And she makes it very clear she doesn't want to have sex with him. They're just gonna, you know, fool around a little bit, not do anything crazy. Uh, but while they're doing that, he tries to feed on here, her, and he also realizes that she let Lissa do it. So he's basically going, oh, come on, you let her do it, let me do it, you slut. Dimitri appears and tells both of them off, and Jesse goes off running, and he tells Rose that she doesn't have time to be fooling around because she has to focus or she'll fail as a guardian. Because Dimitri takes his duty as a guardian very, very seriously and inspires Rose to do the same, not just in this first book, but throughout the whole series. Rose flashes back to before her and Lissa ran off. Uh, the two of them and Miss Carp find a dead raven, and then Lissa goes up to it and brings it back to life with her magic. And Carp is shocked by that and says that she has to keep that a secret or people will come after them. And then back in the present, Rose is getting horny because of her training. And sometimes, if I was really, really lucky, he'd smile at me. A real smile, too. Not the dry one that accompanied the sarcasm we tossed around so often. I didn't want to admit it to anyone. Not to Lissa, not even to myself. But some days, I lived for those smiles. They lit up his face. Gorgeous no longer adequately describbered him. That, uh, that's a typo in a 17-year-old book. <laughs> a 17-year-old book which has had reprintings. Come on, guys. So the Queen of the Vampires, her name is Tatiana, visits their school. She, here's her picture. It's the Queen from the Queen of the Damned. Now, in front of everybody, the Queen talks shit on Lyssa, saying that she's irresponsible and a disgrace to her family name. Kind of shitty to do to a literal teenager in front of all of these people. But that's what she does. And later, Rose mentions that Natalie's dad, remember, Victor, uh, should be in charge. Because Victor likes to talk about how reforms are needed. Like... It doesn't really play a huge role in the first book, but Strigoi attacks have been increasing for years. Like, they're attacking all the time, killing more and more people, the number of Maroi is going down all the time, so they can't play de defense, you know? Victor wants to track them down and attack them where they live. And Rose identifies a lot with this desire. Later, Lissa finds another dead animal, this time a rabbit, and a note telling her to leave. And she freaks out and cuts her wrists, which is something that she has done before. Rose knows about it. And Rose and the others help her clean up a little bit, but later Mia taunts them about it. She found out that Lissa fed on Rose and has been spreading the rumor all around school. And so now people are mocking Rose for being a blood whore. And Rose is convinced that Christian is the one that told, so she goes and confronts him. But, and he denies it, but she doesn't really seem to believe it. There's also a rumor going around that Rose has been having sex with Jesse and Ralph, and that they, she let them drink her blood during it which she realizes, okay, Mia must have been the one behind that. Lissa says that she will use compulsion to fix things and get people to stop saying that, but Rose says no, because the more Lissa uses her powers, the worse she gets mentally. But she does it anyways, and Christian sees her compelling someone, and he disapproves, which, you know, fair enough. And Rose also takes a little bit of time to whine about how being a guardian will wreck her looks. I looked down at my hands. They'd suffered for weeks, and today had only made them worse. The cold had turned the skin raw and chapped, and some parts were actually bleeding a little. My blisters swelled. Don't have any. Never needed them in Portland. He swore again, and beckoned me to a chair while he retrieved a first aid kit. Wiping away the blood with a wet cloth, he told me, gruffly, We'll get you some. I looked down at my destroyed hands as he worked. This is only the start, isn't it? Of what? Me, turning into Alberta, her, and all the other female guardians. They're all leathery and stuff. Fighting and training and always being outdoors. They aren't pretty anymore. I paused. This, this life, it destroys them. Their looks, I mean. That's a very good thing to include in this book. Doesn't make Rose seem vain and whiny at all. Now, Rose brings up her mother, and Dimitri says that she should be nicer to her. He tells a story about how his father was a Moroi royal who abused him, his mom, and his sisters when he was a kid until one day he finally got fed up with it, and he was only 13 years old, but he was able to beat up his dad. Uh, and he's right, Rose's mother could have been a lot worse, but at the same time, she left her daughter alone at school and went off to guard more important people, so I think Rose is within her rights to be resentful. And the series never really grapples with that. It, it's such a small thing that I, I don't know, I wish they'd spent some more time with it. But anyways, Christian finds some more writings from St. Vladimir, and he gives them to Rose. 
And while reading, she finds that St. Vladimir could heal and compel people a lot, but when he did it, it made him irrationally sad or angry, so she realizes, okay, this guy had what we would now call depression. And she thinks back to Miss Carp again, and she has a conversation with her, and Carp tells her that she is Shadow Kissed. That's why Rose has been so focused on finding out what Shadow Kissed Anna had going on. She tells her once again to prevent Lyssa from using her powers too much or people will find her. And she uses compulsion to make Rose want to run away with Lyssa. And after that, the Guardians grab Carp and take her away somewhere to recover, but we know now in the future that she never really recovered. In the present, Rose and Lyssa go to a party and it seems to go well, but it causes Rose to think back to a different party before they ran off and there were some boys feeding on a human girl and she was clearly confused and very out of it. It's like half a step above date rape, basically, is what they're all doing. And Lyssa sees this and asks Rose to step in and stop it because she just can't bring herself to intervene and do anything. Uh, and Rose intervenes and gets them to stop doing it in front of everybody, but then one boy takes the feeder girl away, and Rose is too drunk to do anything, so she just lets it go. But then a minute later, Lyssa vanishes, and they find her later in that dude's room, and she's using compulsion to stop uh, whatever he was planning on doing to that girl and destroy all his own stuff with a baseball bat. And Rose stops her, and then she leaves out the compulsion stuff. She just tells the authority figures that she's the one that destroyed everything. And then two days later is when they run off, and then they're just on the run for two years, and then the story begins. So we're all caught up now. Everybody got that? So for some reason, Lissa starts dating Mia's boyfriend, whose name is Aaron. And Mia and Christian are both really sad about this. And Rose realizes that St. Vladimir, Miss Carp, and Lissa all have above average control of all four elements, because that's how Moroi magic works. There's the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And most people specialize in a single one. However, Lissa, St. Vladimir, and Miss Carp all have above average control in all four of them, but none of them specialize in a single element like other Moroi. And they say that if you specialize in all of them at once, too much power will drive you insane. Hint, 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 hint. And she finally decides to tell Lissa about all the research she's been doing about St. Vladimir, which you'd think she would have told her about it earlier, but whatever, she tells her about it. And Lissa is kind of disbelieving at first, but after a bit she relents and she realizes, okay, yeah, whatever Vladimir had going on is also what I've go got going on. Now, earlier, in order to keep Lissa and Christian apart, Rose did lie to Christian and say that Lissa doesn't return any sort of romantic feelings for him, and that made him even more of a sad emo boy for a little while. But Rose does tell him the truth, and then she apologizes for lying and asks him to be friends with her again, because when they're together, Lissa's mental state seemed to be doing a lot better. And I also just want to point out, Lissa and Christian bond largely because they both saw their parents die. Which, I guess there are weirder things to bond over, but that is still... It, it, it caught me off guard. Later they find yet another dead animal, this time a dove, and Rose convinces Lissa not to heal it. Just leave it. Let it, let it be dead. And then they go on a shopping trip outside of the school. And along the way, they learn that Miss Carp turned herself into a Strigoi and ran off from wherever she was being held. Like, she fed on someone until he died, and then she ran off. So now she's a Strigoi hiding somewhere in the wilderness. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. Rose sees a necklace that she really likes, but it's expensive and she can't afford it. So she just goes, ah, eh, that would be really nice, but I can't afford it. And then later, she's back at school, walking on a bench. She trips and then breaks her ankle. So they take her to the school's clinic, and while recuperating, she receives the necklace from earlier as a gift. It's a gift from Victor. Now, royals run businesses and stuff in the human world, so they, they, are, they have tons of money. A necklace like that, even if it was expensive, wouldn't be a big deal for him. So Rose is just thinking, oh, this is a, this is a nice gift. Thanks, Lissa's Uncle Victor. Now, Lissa actually heals her ankle as well against Rose's will, and she's away somewhere crying from the strain when Christian appears. And he explains to her that Mia hates her so much because she had a fling with Lissa's older brother a couple of years ago. And they kept it secret because Mia is not from a good family, whereas Lissa's brother was one of the Dragomirs. Then he broke up with her without any fanfare, and it just really hurt her. And this is a small moment, it's a small detail, 
but I absolutely love it because Mia is, yeah, she's a bitchy cheerleader type, sure, but usually that would make her a totally one-dimensional, boring character. She would have no real reason to be the way she, she is, but in Vampire Academy, Mia is a victim. She was used and cast aside, and now she's obsessed with increasing her own social status to make sure that doesn't happen again. And at the same time, she has a major inferiority complex. Like, how many other books of this type would take time to develop the mean bully character? Very, very few. This is also a reminder that Lissa's family, while she did love them, they were flawed people. You know, they didn't always do the right thing, they did hurt people and stuff, and that does come back later as well. Put a pin in that. Uh, they weren't paragons of love and kindness like dead loved ones usually are, not just in young adult stuff, but in any sort of fiction, really. Like, usually if the characters think back to a dead loved one, like a parent or a brother or whoever, that person is perfect in their memories, but that's not the case for Lissa and her family. Vampire Academy isn't great, but details like that do give me an appreciation for it. You know, there was clearly some effort being put in here. So anyways, Christian also calls Rose and Lissa out for lying and manipulating people, which, fair enough, they, they have been doing some of that throughout this. And the two of them kiss, but she tells him to leave, and then she cuts herself, because... Believe me, depression makes you do weird things. So Rose finally decides this has gone too far. She tells somebody about Lissa's cutting herself, and she winds up being hospitalized very briefly. Then a big school dance happens, and during the dance, Mason takes Rose to Jesse and Ralph, and they admit that they lied about having sex with her and feeding on her, which, yeah, she, she already... I'm pretty sure Rose already knew that, but whatever. They admit to her that they were lying, and they did it because Mia slept with them and told them to do it. Of course I mean sex. She, shed, she said she'd do it if we said that we'd, uh, you know... I made a face. You guys didn't both, uh, do it at the same time, did you? No, said Jesse in disgust. Ralph kind of looked like he wouldn't have minded. <laughs> See, like, that, that's a funny line. There, there's some good jokes in these books. And keep in mind that Mia had sex with the two of them while she was still dating Aaron, meaning that she did cheat on him. And just pointing out here real quick that Mason went out and got all of this information on their behalf and got all the others to admit their wrongdoing and apologize to them. Mason's a good friend, you know? He's just, he's a bro. Just, just keep that in mind going forward. Now, Rose refers to Mia as a sociopath. Mia confronts them and freaks out a little bit. Rose finally gives into her instincts and punches her. And then she gets pulled out of the dance by the Guardians, and there's, like, some commotion. And in all that commotion, Lissa and Christian run off outside together with no one around. But through their bond, Rose can see some mysterious people surround Lissa and then attack her and attack Christian as well, and they leave him incapacitated, and they take Lissa away somewhere. But then something cuts off their bond, and before Rose gets the chance to go off and tell somebody about this, which is her first instinct, something tells her to go to Dimitri, and in a trance, she goes off to his room, telling no one what she saw through the bond. She arrives at Dimitri's room, and then they start making out, and they nearly have sex. And it's creepy, because he's, you know, one, he's too old for her, two, he's an authority figure, but it did lead to this amazing scene in the movie. I love you, Charles. Let's burn it. Why the fuck would you throw the dress in the fire? Can anyone give me an explanation as to why they would do that? But just when the two of them are about to get busy, he takes the necklace off of Rose, which is the one from Victor that she's been wearing this whole time, and they both regain their senses and realize, number one, this is wildly inappropriate. Number two, Lissa's in trouble. We need to go help her. So they get dressed, they tell Christian, they tell Headmistress Kirova, and then they gather up some guardians and they go after Lissa. And through the bond, Rose is able to tell more or less where she is. And they also realize Victor is behind the kidnapping. Now, Dimitri and Rose don't mention the near sex. Uh, he says the necklace made Rose attack him uh, until he took it off of her. Now, Lissa is taken to a cabin out in the middle of nowhere, and Victor greets her. He says he wanted to make it look like she ran away, and he needs her to heal his Sandowski syndrome. More specifically, he had his daughter Natalie, remember she exists, uh, put the dead animals around in order to, number one, test her ability, and number two, reveal it and make sure that, yeah, she really did have this power. And he says that she can use spirit, which is the fifth element. 
But in order to heal Sandowski's syndrome, it's not just a one and done. He would need regular treatment in order to, you know, keep himself from dying. And Lissa tells him, well, you should have just asked, dude. I, I would gladly have done that. You're my family. But he retorts and says that the school wouldn't have let her do it because of the side effects. Because the thing is, earth magic gets power from earth, air magic from air, etc. Spirit users, they eat away at their own essence. The more they use their power, the more it eats away at them. That's why they go crazy. And when she brought Rose back from the dead after the car crash, that formed their bond. Because that's the thing. Rose didn't nearly die in the crash. She did die. Lissa straight up brought her back to life. And Victor mentions that he was supposed to be Queen Tatiana's heir to become king, but then the disease showed up and he just got pushed out of the running, which later they reveal and confirm that Moroi monarchs are elected. They aren't, it's not hereditary, but okay. But he does want to become king and reform vampire society, kind of like I was saying earlier. You know, Strigoi attacks are getting worse. More of them are getting wiped out all the time. Victor wants to go after the Strigoi. He wants to train to use magic offensively against them and fight alongside their guardians. And Lissa and Rose actually think that's a great idea. They just don't think it's worth keeping Lissa prisoner. So she refuses to help, and so they torture her for a bit, and through the bond, Rose is also feeling it. Basically, they just smother her with air magic until she's about to pass out, and then let her breathe for a few seconds, and then start smothering her again. And after a little bit of this, she relents, and she does heal Victor. Instantly, he looks healthier. Now, the Guardians and Rose arrive. The Guardians go off to the cabin to save Lyssa, and Rose is forced to wait in the van. Also, Christian somehow stowed away in the van with them. I guess they didn't check, but he he's there too. And Lyssa, in the cabin, uses compulsion to distract a guard, and then she jumps out a window and runs off, and so Rose goes after her because it's daytime, and daytime makes Moroi really weak. And Christian goes too. The two of them manage to catch up to Lyssa, and she has been cornered by psychic dogs that are under Victor's control. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, psy hounds, psychic dogs that people control. Like, you'd think that would be relevant in the rest of the series, but um, no, this is the only time they show up. Disappointed! So Rose fights them off for a little bit with a tree branch, and Christian uses fire to burn them. Uh, but they jump on him and they maul him really, really badly before a guardian shows up and kills all the hounds with a gun because guns aren't very useful against Strigoi, but they're great against other things. You ever notice how easy it is to kill a person with a gun? Wait, that sounds really weird, cut that out. Christian is about to die from getting mauled by the hounds, and Lissa is too weak to use any magic to heal him, so Rose says, okay, just feed on me a bit. So R Lissa feeds on her, she gets her energy back, and then she heals Christian, and then he's all better. So this is basically Rose, like, finally saying, okay, Christian's a decent guy, I'm willing to help out to save his life. And Victor actually gets arrested and gets taken away by the Guardians to a cell, which is at the school. The school has jail cells for some reason. Now, Rose speaks to Dimitri, and he says that he needs to tell others about what happened between them, even if it was just a spell. And she says, no, you can't go telling people that. You'll be fired, which rightfully so, a lot of people would argue. Like, it was kind of inappropriate, even if it was magically forced on them. But he says it was wrong because she's a child and he's also just not interested in her. So she sulks for a little bit and then leaves. And then she goes to visit Victor and demands that he breaks the spell he placed on them. But he says the spell is already over. You know, like they had a pre-existing attraction. All the spell did was remove their inhibitions. And he also finally explains to her what Shadow Kiss means. It refers to somebody he, who died and then was brought back to life, like Rose or Anna. He also implies that he has many followers who wish to fix vampire society and change it for the better, which never seems to come back up in the series, but you know, he, he says it in this book. And then Natalie comes in and she grabs Rose and just throws her against the wall. She is a Strigoi now. She killed one of their teachers to turn herself. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. And so she frees her dad, and he runs off. Basically, she turned herself Strigoi at her dad's behest because throughout this whole book, he's been kind of ignoring her and just doting on Lyssa. And so Natalie is just wanting her dad to love her. She's going, yes, now do you love me, daddy? I turned myself into an immortal monster for you. Now do you love me? And Natalie is also the one that killed the animals that Lyssa was finding. You know, it, it wasn't Victor doing it. It was, it was his daughter doing it on his behalf. And I actually do like this twist 
Like, it, it makes perfect sense in retrospect, but Natalie is just so unthreatening, and she, she's there throughout the book. I just wasn't mentioning her because she doesn't really do anything. So her being the twist villain actually does make perfect sense. So she beats up Rose a little bit, and then Dimitri appears, and Natalie is powerful, like all Strigoi, but she is unused to her strength, and so Dimitri kills her. He stabs her in the heart with a stake, and she dies. And that's that. She never comes back. Now, Dimitri takes Rose to the school's clinic and says they can't be together. He doesn't say they can't be together because of the age gap or, you know, any of the other problems. He says they can't be together because they might both be Lissa's guardians one day and that he needs to focus on just protecting her, not be worrying about anyone else. And please note that throughout the rest of the series, this remains the primary reason he gives for not wanting to enter a relationship with his underage student. Victor is very quickly recaptured, so Natalie's death was completely pointless. Lissa, also now her spirit powers, that gets out to at least a couple of people, and her mental problems are now known, so they put her on antidepressants, which they help her out, but they also dull her magic. I don't like that implication, because it's a common misconception that antidepressants or other mental health whatever pills will be bad for your creativity, or they make you somehow fake, and that's just not true. So I don't like that they suppress her magic, but that's what they do. And after this, Rose has an epiphany. She realizes their teacher, Miss Carp, turned herself Strigoi because it removed her magic. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. Being a Strigoi, like yeah, she has to kill people now, but it also allows her to stay sane because the temptation to use her spirit powers was always going to be there, but now she can't, no matter what she wants to do. And Rose also learns that Saint Vladimir died of old age. Anna, his guardian, supported him throughout all of that. She kept him sane so he didn't kill himself and he didn't go Strigoi. And so Rose resolves that she's going to be there for Lyssa, for her friend, forever. And the raven that Lyssa healed before they ran off lands near Rose and she realizes that, okay, the raven is also bonded to Lyssa. And that never comes back at any point, but for a moment it seems important. And that is the end of Vampire Academy, book one of the Vampire Academy series. Tomorrow. Hi friends, so just to clear up any confusion, yes, some of the pictures are a little different than they were. I already filmed this section for books two and three, but the footage was bad, so I have to redo it. Also, remember how I have merch? You should check some of that out in my merch store down below. Go check it out, do that. So now we go to book two, which is called Frostbite. We start with multiple pages of recap about Maroi and Strigoi, and Lissa, and how her powers work, and really just the whole first book, it's kind of unnecessary, goes on longer than it needs to be, and it needs to. Uh, and then we go to the actual story of book two. It starts with Lissa saying that her pills aren't working as well as they used to, because she feels okay, but now her powers are starting to come back. But the thing is, it's only been a couple of months since the end of book one, you know, antidepressants and other pills like that, they take time to work. Maybe experiment a little, just, just throwing that out there. Anyways, Rose has an interview the next day uh, to determine if she can be a guardian, and so Dimitri is supposed to drive her out to the guy who's giving her the interview. His name is Arthur Schoenberg. He's a very famous, very accomplished guardian. So after a long drive away from the academy, they find his house, but the door is ajar, so Dimitri goes in to investigate, and he tells Rose to stay in the car. She disobeys and goes outside to investigate, obviously, because what would you expect Rose to do? And it's daytime, so there's no Strigoi around, but she does find a silver stake just laying out on the ground, which is odd because those things are really valuable. The back door of the house is broken open, and Rose goes inside and sees multiple dead people. The scale of the death around me suddenly registered, and my heart began pounding. No. No, it wasn't possible. It was day. Bad things couldn't happen in daylight. What? That's... That's an odd thing to say in general, but I guess the book really likes it because she uses that exact line again in dialogue when she's talking to Dimitri. One of the people who was killed was Arthur Schoenberg himself. Who, remember, he's supposed to be an accomplished guardian, so this is a pretty big deal. It also looks like the killing happened a few days ago from the look of, look of things. And Dimitri realizes that, okay, Arthur had magic wards around his house, so the silver stake was used to break through the wards. Why did they leave it behind afterwards? Don't worry about it. You know, it's only Moroi can make those, so it's not like Strigoi would, you know, 
think that they're valuable and want to keep their hands on them if they got one, you know? And this isn't some sort of bait or trap either. They just left it there so the heroes could figure out what was going on. The thing is, Strigoi can't touch silver stakes because it burns them, and a Moroi or Dampier obviously would never help them out, which is a, a bit of a leap. Uh, so they determined, okay, it must have been a human. It must have been a human working with Strigoi, got their hands on a silver stake, destroyed the wards, and then the Strigoi came in and killed people. Uh, again, that's a bit of a leap. And you might think that's like, a big deal going forward, like humans and Strigoi working together, oh no, but like, no, it's just, it, it's basically a footnote. So they call in the other guardians, and then the other guardians come in and invest, investigate. They ask Rose what she thinks happened, and she deduces that at least six Strigoi attacked, they took down the guardians first, and then they killed the rest of them. They also left a taunting message at the scene saying that they've nearly wiped out uh, the Batica family, the Batikas being one of the royal families, and the rest are to follow. But according to Rose, the Batica family is one of the smaller ones, and there's about 200 members left. So I'm not sure what their definition of almost wiped out is. Like, you know, Lissa, the Dragomir family has one remaining member. That's almost wiped out. But 200 is not small. So Rose is really mad and feels kind of helpless as they leave. Because remember, Strigoi attacks have been going up in recent years. When she gets back to St. Vladimir, she sees Lissa and Christian, and they remark that everyone is nervous about the Strigoi and not traveling this Christmas like they usually do. And that's going to cause issues among the royals because they use that time for political maneuvering. Again, this never comes back, but it, it's a small detail they threw in there. And in the next chapter, Mason tells Rose that there's going to be a school trip. In order to make up for the lack of travel, the school is organizing a school uh, ski trip to Idaho because there's a ski lodge owned by Moroi Royals. I hope they have warm clothing, otherwise they might get frostbite. The next day, Rose does her first day of training with a silver stake, with, you know, Dimitri, because training with a stake is really advanced stuff. We learn that they hurt Moroi and Strigoi, but they don't hurt Dampier and humans, at least not more than a long, sharp piece of metal can normally hurt Dampier and humans. Uh, but, you know, like I said, Strigoi get burned when it touches them. Moroi don't get burned when they touch it, so really, they just hurt Strigoi, and Dimitri is wrong when he says this. Whatever, the point is, Strigoi are kind of dead and kind of alive, like, that's why they don't age, and spirit users can see auras around people, but Strigoi have none. That's why they're vulnerable to magic, including silver stakes, just, just throwing that out there. So Dimitri asks Rose to point out the heart on a training dummy, and she's unable to do it, so she has to train for a while to be able to hit that spot regularly. Uh, she leaves for another class, and Mason actually flirts with her for a bit, and she is okay with it. I smell a love triangle. Anyways, in her next class is Rose's mom. Her name is Janine Hathaway. She is Scottish, so here's Saoirse Ronan playing Mary Queen of Scots. She's a special guest brought into the class along with some other guardians. They tell stories of their time as guardians for the novices to learn from. Like, hey, this is the sort of situation you might run into out in the field. And Janine, in particular, tells a story about killing a bunch of Strigoi. Afterwards, Rose calls her out, asking questions that make her sound incompetent. So what you're saying is that you guys either failed to detect them during your first sweep, or they broke through the security you set up during the party. Seems like someone messed up either way. Which is a fair point, but the teacher makes her leave for being rude, and then later, Janine tells her off for running off and being irresponsible, like when her and Lissa ran away from school for a while. Rose pretty clearly doesn't value her input. Now, Janine is correct, Rose is irresponsible, but it's hard to blame Rose for dismissing her and her opinions. Like, she's a shitty parent. She, she just is. She has largely abandoned her kid. So after some more training, Dimitri takes Rose to a hidden pond on campus uh, where Lissa and Christian are also ice skating. And then Christian's aunt is also there. Her name is Tasha. She's a Maroi, but she's not very wealthy. She works as a martial arts teacher, and she wants Maroi to train to defend themselves so that they are less reliant on guardians. She's less she's semi-important throughout the series, so she gets a picture, and it's, uh, it's this. There's also a cabin nearby that they all visit. Why is that on school grounds? I have, I have no idea, but it's there. They all get along great. Rose likes Tasha because Tasha also dislikes the royals. 
Later, Rose is sparring with her mother, and they still don't get along. Janine looks down on Dampier who don't become guardians, even if the reason that they're not guardians is that they're at home, you know, raising kids. And Janine refers to, refers to them as blood whores who engage in pointless flings. And Rose retorts that Janine never actually married Rose's father. How'd it happen? I asked. Were you on some assignment in Turkey? Meet him at a local bazaar? Or was it even cheaper than that? Did you go all Darwin and select the guy most likely to pass on warrior genes to your offspring? I mean, I know you only had me because it was your duty, so I suppose you could make sure to give the Guardians the best specimen you could. Ouch! Like, again, Rose, like, I, I understand. I'm not, I'm not exactly on her side with this, but yeah, I understand why she's upset with her mom. But still, ouch. <laughs> so Janine uh, knocks her on her ass, and she has to be carried to the medical clinic with a possible concussion. She's fine, she doesn't have a concussion or anything, but she does have a black eye. And she's upset because the trip is about to happen, and she'll look bad be during the trip because of her mom. Like I said, Janine is a shitty parent. You know, your, your nearly adult child uh, mouthing off to you is not an excuse to assault them. She really doesn't seem like she has the self-control needed in a fucking bodyguard. So Rose runs into Mia again, who taunts her about her black eye, and then Rose goes to Lissa, and she's upset because her mom did that on purpose, which she did, to be clear, and Lissa comforts her a little bit, but then she moves on to more important stuff, which is that she's been researching what sort of things her spirit powers might be able to do. Uh, we don't have a lot of advancement in this area right now, but she has been trying to research that. She also teases Rose about boys a bit before heading off to see Christian. I should note that Lissa doesn't know about Dimitri and Rose at this stage. Now, Rose accidentally goes into Lissa's head when her and Christian are about to have sex, but she manages to break out of that. Now later, in training, Rose snaps at Dimitri and says that she hates her mom, but he says, you need to have control. But then she kisses him without warning, and he tells her not to do that, and then leaves. And then Christmas happens, and it's lovely for the most part, and Janine gets Rose a pendant of an eye as a gift. She doesn't apologize for hitting her. I know this is her way of apologizing, but it's a shitty way of apologizing. It kind of feels like she's taunting her, like, Hey, remember how I gave you a black eye? Here's a pendant of an eye. She also reveals to Rose that Tasha has requested Dimitri be made her guardian, because Tasha is into Dimitri, and would be willing to marry him and have Dampier children, which might be Dimitri's only chance to ever get married or have kids, because like I said, Dampier are very, very much second-class citizens. Dampier women get screwed over by being used as sex objects. Dampier men get screwed over by being ignored unless the royals need a warm body to fight their battles for them. They have very few chances to marry or have children. Kind of feels like a metaphor for society, but what do I know? Now, Rose is upset at the thought of Dimitri with Tasha, and Janine is just annoyed with Rose in general. So the ski trip that we mentioned earlier finally comes along. The students fly there in private jets because there are apparently multiple private jets which are owned by the Academy. <laughs> like, all right, Montana and Idaho aren't that far apart. You could take a bus, Taylor Swift. On the flight, Rose sits with Mason, the two of them flirt some more, and she tells herself that she should really move on from Dimitri, which yeah, she probably should. There's even some X-rated hand-holding between R Mason and Rose. So they get to the ski lodge. It's super nice and luxurious. Mason, Rose, Lissa, and Christian do, quote, kind of a double date thing, which I I'm aware that's how a teenager would actually describe that, but it is still a weird line to read. <laughs> so Rose and Mason do some crazy ski stunts, and she's fine afterwards, but he sprains his ankle. This doesn't really lead anywhere, it's just like, yeah, the, the two of them are being reckless and irresponsible. So she meets a smoking Moroi man, I, I, I say man, he's, he's still pretty young, he's only 21, uh, and he aggressively flirts with her and talks about her sweat a lot for a, a while, like too long. Sweat isn't a bad thing, he said, leaning his head against the wall and looking upward thoughtfully. Some of the best things in life happen while sweating. Yeah, if you get too much of it and it gets old and stale, it turns pretty gross. But on a beautiful woman? Intoxicating. If you could smell things like a vampire does, you'd know what I'm talking about. Most people mess it all up and drown themselves in perfume. Perfume can be good, especially if you get one that goes with your chemistry, but you only need a hint. Mix about 20% of that with 80% of your own perspiration. Mmm. 
He tilted his head to the side and looked at me. Dead sexy. Okay, that's somebody's fetish, I'm sure. Anyways, this guy's name is Adrian Ivashkov, or Ivashkov. Uh, he is a royal Maroi. Specifically, he is the great nephew of Queen Tatiana. He's described as constantly being smoking, so after a while, I just pictured him like this. Now, he asks Rose, again, while flirting with her, he asks her if he, she's going to be a guardian when she grows up, because he might need one. And, and again, that's just his way of flirting, but, like, again, he's 21, she's a high school student, maybe, maybe, maybe just chill out. <laughs> so Adrian keeps this up for a bit, and Mia comes over and acts snarky, and then Rose just leaves. She takes off. Then later, she dreams about Adrian, and wakes up to hear news of another Strigoi attack. Now, don't worry, it wasn't nearby anywhere, but there are eight dead Maroi, three that are missing, who might be dead, they might have been turned Strigoi, but we don't know yet, and five dead guardians. Rose looks at the list of the dead and sees Mia's mother is listed on it, and she feels really bad for her for a minute, as, you know, you probably should. So everyone gathers together, they have a giant meeting trying to figure out what to do. There are several suggestions, some people say, they should conscript more Dampyr and make them be guardians. Some say that they should make them guardians at 16 instead of age 18. But then Tasha says that Moroi should start fighting, specifically with magic, and that they should go on the offense, not just protect themselves. But people are unenthusiastic with the idea of having to actually work to protect themselves, so they get really mad at her. Rose and Dimitri leave as this whole big fight is going on, and she gets kind of butthurt about him possibly becoming... Tasha's guardian. Well, I'm sure you guys will be happy together. She's just your type, too. I know how much you like women who aren't your own age. I mean, she's, what, six years older than you? Seven? And I'm seven years younger than you. Yes, he said after several moments of silence. You are. And every second this conversation goes on, you only prove how young you really are. Yes. Yes. That, again, she's acting the way that an immature teenager would normally act, and Dimitri is responding the way that you would respond to that in that situation. So surely he couldn't be attracted to her if he's talking about how young and immature she is. Now, in order to make Dimitri jealous, Rose walks off with Adrian. Like, yeah, walk off with someone who's a bit more age appropriate. That'll, that'll really show him. Adrian takes her to his friends, which is in a nice royal part of the lodge, like exclusive, uh, where they're having a pool party. There are other Guardian novices there who seem open to fighting Strigoi before they turn 18. Uh, a fight nearly breaks out, but Rose stops it, and then Adrian flirts with her some more privately. Now, Lissa comes over to this area as well, and Adrian seems to have a weird hold over her, almost like compulsion, kind of. Rose attempts to have sex with Mason, but she's kind of drunk at the time, so he refuses and says, eh, when, when you've sobered up later, just not, not right now, which... Yes, thank you, Mason, for being a decent guy. Like, he, he really has done nothing but help her out this whole time. And he can tell that she's upset and not thinking straight. He's not going to take advantage of her while doing that. The next day, Adrian sends a box of expensive perfumes to Rose, but she returns it. Uh, Dimitri chastises her and says, Hey, girl, Dim uh, Adrian's not safe to be around. He, he doesn't elaborate, which is weird. For him, you know, like, a, the, the worst that could happen is Adrian's a bit of a fuckboy, but th there's nothing bad that might happen. They also all figure out that the Strigoi who attacked the people the other day are hiding in Spokane, which is not far away. Mason suggests going there to fight since the royals aren't doing anything. He's like, hey, let's just go track them down there and kill them. Uh, they, and he nearly has sex with Rose again, but Rose keeps thinking about Dimitri, so she stops. And again, Mason's totally fine with it. Later, they're at yet another royal party. And after some deliberation, the royals agree to train Moroi in combat at the academy. That way, they'll be less reliant on the guardians. Honestly, it's a little strange that this wasn't already a thing. Like, I I'm not sure why there weren't at least some Moroi who were training to fight at least a little bit, but... Okay, whatever. Now, Adrian also hints to Rose that he can affect her dreams, but before she gets a chance to ask more information, Janine comes over and pulls her away. And she tells her not to act like a cheap whore, and she's afraid of her getting pregnant, despite Rose insisting that there's nothing going on between the two of them. Like, okay, Janine, she, she's clearly concerned, but she's being a bitch about it. 
Eventually she leaves and then Dimitri comes over and he tells Rose exactly what I said. Like, hey, your, your mom's just worried about you. And Rose does realize at this point that, yeah, her mom had her when she was really young and she doesn't want uh, her daughter to repeat her mistakes, which, again, perfectly understandable. I get why she's acting this way, but I also understand why Rose isn't happy with her for acting this way. So she tells uh, Dimitri to take the job with Tasha if that's what he wants to do. So she's letting him go, basically, which seems like a moment of character development, but don't worry, it, it doesn't last very long. Then she goes off to talk to Mason to, so that she can tell him, hey man, there, there's nothing between us. You're a friend, but that's all you can be. I just, I'm just not, I don't feel that way about you. But Mason isn't in his room. He left the lodge with Eddie and Mia, even though the lodge is under lockdown. When Rose goes to look at the guards who are looking after the perimeter, she notices they're under compulsion and she realizes, okay, Mia must have used compulsion on them. Uh, and she realizes that they're all heading towards the highway, which will take them to Spokane. Now, Mason, like I said, he wants to go off and kill Strigoi, and this is his way of showing society that, yeah, my plan is really good. This, this is a good idea, guys. Like, so he's just rushing off without telling anyone and without uh, having any way of really looking after himself. This is stupid, but it's also the kind of stupid plan that a bunch of 17-year-olds would probably do in real life. So Rose goes to Christian and she asks him to compel the guards so that she can leave and go after them and bring them back before anything bad happens. Uh, Christian's compulsion doesn't work very well, so Rose just knocks him unconscious instead and they head off. They hop a bus and they head to Spokane. Specifically, they go to a shopping mall that was mentioned earlier. They find the others really quickly and without any trouble whatsoever. That was easy. The others tell her that, hey, this was a bust, there's no Strigoi hiding in the tunnels below the mall, our information was bad. They do manage to convince Rose to go down there and take a second look, just in case, because they're like, hey, we, we came all the way out here, let's just double check just to make sure. So she goes down there and she sees a list written on the wall. And after a second, she realizes, oh, this is a list of all the royal families, all, all the Moroi royal families. The Strigoi are going to try and hunt them down and eradicate them one by one. So they skedaddle, and after they leave them all, on the surface, they run into a van full of humans. And the men pop out and attack. They take Mia hostage with a gun. And Rose stops resisting because Dampier are trained from birth to believe that Moroi are more important. <laughs> that's, that's not subtext. That's literally just what the book says. No one ever really questions this either. Like, it's clear that people think it's really shitty and unfair, but no one ever really questions it and tries to change it, but okay, whatever. So all of them are restrained and taken to a house in the suburbs. There is a really big fish tank near the entrance. That, that's an important detail in a little bit, I swear. So, and they also see that, oh, hey, there are Strigoi in this house. <laughs> Their names are Isaiah and Elena. They taunt Christian about his parents for a minute, going, Mahaha, your parents turned into Strigoi by, of their own free will, and now you're going to be turned into one, or you'll die, Mwahaha. But Elena does something that annoys Isaiah, so he shoves her and then she apologizes to him. And Rose realizes, okay, this Isaiah fella must be really old and he's probably fed on a lot of Moroi over the years. Uh, because the Strigoi don't have any sort of government, but they do respect power, so whatever Strigoi is the most powerful in an area, all the others will flock to them and do what they say. Everyone is taken to a basement and restrained, and Isaiah tells Christian and Mia that one of them will get to live, the other one will be eaten. Uh, the, the three Dampier are going to be killed no matter what. Uh, all that ha they have to do is Christian or Mia, one of them has to kill one of the novices and turn themselves Strigoi, and then they'll get to live. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. So Isaiah feeds on Eddie just a little bit. He doesn't kill him. And then he taunts them and says they'll break eventually. And then they just leave him locked up there without, you know, food or water. And they're there for a long time. After a while, Rose falls asleep and Adrian visits her in her dream. She doesn't get the chance to tell him where they are before waking up, but she does know everyone's worried and looking for them. Now, through her bond with Lissa, she sees Lissa talking with Adrian for a bit. Now, she realizes that he is also a spirit user. That's how he is able to walk through people's dreams the way he does. His drinking and smoking are just self-medicating. It suppresses the side effects of his power. And he convinces Lissa to stop taking her anti-depression pills so that she can learn to dreamwalk. And this seems like it'll be bad, and it's 
going somewhere unpleasant, but then Rose wakes up. So Rose, it, like they're being watched by some human guards at this stage. So Rose signals to Christian and they manage to come up with a plan without talking to each other at all. And Christian says basically like, okay, I've made my choice. I'm gonna go feed on Rose and kill her, turn myself Spragoy. So they let him go close to her and then he pretends to feed on her, but really he uses magic to melt her handcuffs. And then she breaks free and attacks the guards. One of them nearly shoots her, but Christian heats up his gun and he drops it. So they take down the guards, they restrain them, and then they free the others and run off. But Isaiah and Elena are blocking the exit. Rose resolves to distract them so that the others can run off and get to safety. She's sacrificing herself with zero hesitation. Now she still has the gun that they took from the human guard, so she shoots Elena with it, and then Mason manages to open the front door. Now sunlight comes pouring in, the others are able to get away, but Isaiah grabs Rose and is able to drag her into the shadows. And like I said, the others run away, but Mason comes back, he grabs the gun, and he empties the entire magazine into Isaiah's chest. There's no response from Isaiah, which doesn't really make sense, like based on everything else we see that should have at least stunned him for a minute, but okay, he, there's no response from him, so Mason jumps at him and tries to attack barehanded, and Isaiah breaks his neck, like, without any issue whatsoever. Mason dies, just like that. Inspired by him going back, Mia also comes back, and then she uses the water in the fish tank to make a bubble around Isaiah's head. He won't drown, but it does distract him for a minute. So Rose is able to grab some broken glass from the tank and stab him in the heart. This doesn't kill him, but he goes down. Which, again, you'd think a bunch of bullets to the chest would also put him down for a minute, but whatever, whatever. So there's also a decorative sword on the wall nearby, and Rose grabs it and attacks Elena with it. Elena, under most circumstances, could probably beat Rose, but she's wounded from getting shot, and she's also shaken from seeing Isaiah hurt, so Rose is able to cut her head off with it. And then Isaiah, while he's still recovering, she cuts his head off. And then Mia tries to get Rose to run and escape out of here, but she refuses. She just wants to sit there, sit there with Mason's body. Eventually, help arrives, and then Dimitri takes Rose away while she is in shock, which is one way to resolve a love triangle, I suppose. So Rose is given some tattoos on her neck. They're called Mo Monesia tattoos. Uh, which all Guardians have. It's, or specifically, it's a mark that Guardians get for killing Strigoi. Many, some Guardians never kill them, but she's killed too before she's even an adult, which is really impressive. And from here on out, people generally take Rose more seriously. Like, they don't give her a free pass on everything. They still understand that she's really young, but they know that, okay, yeah, she, she can walk the walk. She also realizes that the eye pendant her mom gave her was from her father. She still doesn't know who her father is, but she realizes that was a gift originally from him, and it's supposed to ward off evil. Now, Adrian, because he's now realized that he is a spirit user, uh, is staying at St. Vladimir's for a while to train his spirit powers along with Lyssa, and the love triangle returns. So Rose confides in Dimitri for a bit. She says she feels really guilty over Mason's death, which... Yeah, understandable. Uh, but Dimitri tells her it's not her fault, which it isn't. He also says that he's not going with Tasha because his heart belongs to Rose. She can see into his soul unlike anyone else. And that's seriously one step above telling her how mature she is for her age. Uh, anyways, he kisses her once and then walks off and then the book ends. Now we move on to book three, which is called Shadow Kiss. We start with Rose having a vision of Lyssa and Christian having sex while she's sleeping. That makes her think of Dimitri, and then she wakes up. And then to clear her head, she just <clears throat> goes on a walk outside, and she runs into him because he's patrolling. He's a guardian. That's what he does. And also, Rose has no coat at nighttime in Montana in the winter. Now is a good time to mention that Rose's 18th birthday is coming up very soon. And also, remember Lissa's Uncle Victor? He's going on trial very soon. Lissa and Rose won't be testifying at that trial because I don't, I don't fucking know. Like he's charged with kidnapping and other crimes, you'd think they'd want to bring in some witnesses to his crimes in order to... Okay, whatever. Rose sees an entity that looks like Mason, uh, but then she turns and runs away from it and it vanishes. It, it's really hard to summarize this book because it doesn't really have scenes. It just has a million events that are somewhat important, but they all just happen in a constant flow. So Eddie, Mason's best friend, is now getting really protective of Rose and trying to keep an eye on her and make sure she's okay all the time, which 
Yeah, he, he thinks he's honoring the memories of his dead friend because Mason did die trying to protect Rose, trying to save her from Isaiah at the end. So, yeah, honestly, that does make sense for him to act that way. Eddie is also suddenly a lot more intent on Guardian practice, and he really wants to go out and kill Stragoy, because he now knows what happens if they're not ready when the fight comes for them. Like, Eddie doesn't get a whole lot of development in the series, but th he does get this, if nothing else. All of the Guardian novices are getting ready to do a final exam, and the exam is that they get assigned to a random Maroi student, they act for their Guardian uh, as their Guardian for six weeks, day and night. Uh, real Guardians will, in the meantime, come at them and simulate Stragoi attacks that they have to fight off. Eddie gets assigned to be Lissa's Guardian, and Rose gets assigned to be Christian's Guardian. And Rose is really upset about this, which, number one, it's random. Like, get over it, girl. Were you really expecting them to just assign you to your best friend just because? Like, it... And then Rose, in front of everyone, she doesn't even do this privately, just in front of everyone, she whines to her instructor about how there must be some sort of mistake. Like, to the point where even Dimitri chastises her. Like, what? Which makes me wonder, why does he like her exactly? Like, she likes him because he's gorgeous and protector, protective of weaker people, but he likes her because... She has a lot of growing up to do? I, I really don't know. It, it doesn't make much sense. But the instructors tell her that if she doesn't do the assignment, then she won't graduate, so she leaves in a huff. Which, again, Lissa and Christian are going to be together all the time anyways. You're, you're going to be there, girl. Settle down. Would it kill you to be a little less miserable? She gave me a censoring yet amused look as she licked the last of her strawberry yogurt off her spoon. I mean, he's my boyfriend after all. I hang out with him all the time. It's not that bad. Yes. Yes, like, the book straight up says why Rose is being obnoxious, and yet she continues doing it. So the assignment begins, and it goes well at first. You know, they fight off a couple of fake attacks. But during one of the attacks, Rose sees the ghostly Mason, and she freezes up and lets Christian get killed. And the Guardians think that she did it on purpose, so they call in a disciplinary con committee. But she and Dimitri convince the others that, hey, she, she just screwed up. She she froze up. She goes, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what happened. Nigga, you were there. Like, I don't... <laughs> Later, someone taunts her about her failure, so she attacks. She doesn't attack him, she just attacks the Moroi that he's supposed to be guarding, pinning her against a wall and choking her. She really should have failed after that. Just, <clears throat> you know, if nothing else, she should have failed after that. But she tells Lissa and Christian about uh, Victor's trial, and they are mad that he's not just getting locked up. Like, again, he, he's very guilty, but you still gotta have a trial to show that, yeah, he, he definitely did what he did. Here's his official sentence. Like, he, that, that's how that works, guys. Christian is also getting a little bit jealous because Lissa is spending a lot of time with Adrian in order to figure out their powers. But Rose reassures him. She's like, no, really, you, she really loves you, man. It's, it's fine. It's, it's not a big deal. Christian also takes her with him to the feeders, and apparently Christian really likes to feed on the oldest one they have, it's a woman in her 60s named Alice. I, I guess he just has a gilf fetish or something? I'm not sure, but he, he really likes to feed on that old woman. And as punishment for uh, attacking that other person, Rose has to help clean up the church. Dimitri appears to help her clean up, and she's kind of confused. Uh, but she does mention ghosts to the priest, and the priest there does confirm that they're real which is apparently a common thing in the Russian Orthodox Church, like, believing in ghosts, which, like I said earlier, most Moroi and Dampier are members of the Russian Orthodox Church, but still, it is, it is odd. Later, Rose runs into a younger Moroi student named Jill. Jill. Jill is about 14 years old, so she's really just entering high school age, uh, and then she squeezes for a minute over how cool Rose and company are, she becomes important eventually, so she gets a picture for later. Here's, here's Jill Valentine from Resident Evil. Rose tells Dimitri that she's worried Victor, at his trial, will tell everyone about their relationship, because Victor does know about that, remember? Be and the two of them are kind of ish, secretly dating, sort of. But again, no one knows about this, not, not even Lissa. Luckily, Lissa, Rose, and Christian are all called to testify at Victor's trial. Again, I don't know why they weren't like that before, but they're, they're suddenly called up, and Eddie can also come along because he's going to be guarding Lissa the whole time. So they hop on yet another private jet, and on the ride, Rose gets a massive migraine, and she sees shadows moving around her, and Lissa's 
healing doesn't seem to help it at all. They land at the Moroi Royal Court. And I want you to take a moment to think about it and guess. Like, the, the secret, hidden, magical court of vampires. Where do you think it is? Do you have a guess? Okay, it's in Pennsylvania. <laughs> do, do you remember how House of Night, that was a book series I read years ago, do you remember how the mysterious, magical school that most of the books took place at? That was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm reminded of that. Anyways, after they land, Rose's migraine goes away. And while Lyssa is getting ready to meet with Queen Tatiana, she tells Rose that Adrian is really serious about her, and Rose, reasonably, I would say, thinks that he just wants to have sex with her, because, again, he's, he's a bit of a fuckboy. And through the bond, she watches Lyssa have a meeting with Queen Tatiana. And Lyssa brings a flower back from the dead, but she also tells the Queen that she won't use her powers whenever she orders her to, because she thinks that the royals will just abuse them. And the Queen, clearly wanting to just abuse her powers, uh, dismisses her and is very annoyed. Victor, uh, somehow he heard that Rose is at court, he sends her a note threatening to reveal her and Dimitri's relationship. So the two of them go to his cell to confront him, and Victor tells her that she's really special because she's Shadow Kid. He wants to use Lyssa to help him take over vampire society and change it for the better. Rose refuses, and they leave. They are confident he won't say anything about their relationship because it would ruin the leverage he has over them. And also because Dimitri threatens to have him killed in prison? <laughs> he can do that, apparently. He has connections, but just knowing some prison guards doesn't mean you can order a prisoner to be murdered. So the trial starts. Rose and Lyssa remark that it's a little strange that the only person who determines guilt is Queen Tatiana. There, there's no jury. Almost like monarchy is a really shitty system that puts the majority of the population at a disadvantage or something. Just throwing that out there. Dimitri testifies about the night that Lyssa was kidnapped. Uh, he does lie, saying that Victor charmed Rose to attack him, not to have sex with him. Uh, but during his own testimony, Victor tells everyone about that anyways. Victor chuckled. Well, that's a matter of opinion. I honestly don't think they minded. But if you have time after this case, Your Honor, you might want to consider trying a statutory rape case. The good news, at least the good news for the two of them, is that nobody believes Victor. They think he's making up stories and getting off topic. But the thing is, it, he could poke holes in Dimitri's story here. Like, an, any decent uh, defense attorney would probably just have him talk about how, hey, that charm wasn't there to attack her. It was there to make her have sex with him. Uh, you know, just poke holes in Dimitri's story, poke holes in other people's stories a little bit, put some doubt into there, but okay, whatever, that, that's not what happens. Victor is found guilty, and he's sentenced to life in prison. Up yours, woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. Now, Queen Tatiana offers Lyssa a chance to live at royal court after graduation and attend nearby Lehigh University, because, you know, court is warded, uh, so Strigoi can't get in, it's got a lot of guardians around, it's safe. Uh, and Maroi can't, usually they can only go to a couple of universities, small ones for security reasons, rather than being spread out all over where they're more vulnerable. Uh, after a minute of discussion, Lyssa agrees to the offer. Then Rose goes to see the Queen, and Tatiana tells her to stop seeing Adrian. Rose denies doing anything with him, but Tatiana doesn't believe her, and she threatens to have her assigned to a Maroi other than Lyssa. She acts kind of concerned, saying that Adrian's gonna, excuse me, use her and throw her away like Moroi men always do with Dampier girls. And then she mentions that Rose's dad did something kind of similar with Janine. Uh, she also mentions that her father was named Ibrahim, which Rose didn't know. Ibrahim. That's his name. There we go. I can talk. But really, Tatiana doesn't much care about what happens to Rose. She's just worried about uh, Adrian getting pulled into a, quote, disgraceful marriage. Like, she wants Lyssa and Adrian to get married. She also says that Christian will be bad for Lyssa because he comes from a bad family, and he would make Lyssa's job as the last Dragomir difficult. Rose and Lyssa go off to get a manicure, and we get confirmation that Lyssa is jealous of the way that Rose looks. Then I felt the weirdest thing through the bond. I saw myself through her eyes. It was like looking in a mirror, except she only had a profile view of me. But when she looked at me, she really did think I was beautiful. With my tan and dark brown hair, I seemed exotic to her. She felt pale and washed out compared to me, skinny next to my curves. 
It was surreal, considering how often I felt scruffy next to her volum luminous beauty. <clears throat> her envy wasn't malicious. That wasn't in her nature. It was more wistful, an admiration of a look she could never have. It is nice to have confirmation that the main character is prettier than all the other girls. So they get some massages, and Rose's masseuse is a boy named Ambrose. He's gorgeous, and also Tatiana's personal masseuse, and also her consort, her lover, I don't know, he has sex with her sometimes. He's important eventually, so he gets his own picture. He'll be played by Major General Ambrose Burnsides. Check out that facial hair. Lissa is trying to get Rose and Ambrose to start dating, be a thing, I guess? Like, I, I'm not sure why. Like, Lissa's thinking, oh, Rose, don't you want to start dating a gigolo or something? And it doesn't go anywhere, so I'm not sure why it's included here, but it is included. Ambrose is actually a blood whore because he didn't want to be a guardian. It's dangerous, but that is frowned upon in their society. And Rose stops for a minute and realize, realizes she has a choice in her life's direction. I don't know, this is all a long-winded way of having Ambrose mention that there is a nearby psychic named Rhonda. And Rose and Lissa think she might be a spirit user, so they go to see her. Are you a gypsy? I asked. Rhonda made a face and began shuffling some cards. I'm Roma, she said. A lot of people call us gypsies, though the term isn't exactly accurate. And really, I'm Moroy first. Yeah, this book came out during an odd time period where Americans were starting to realize that gypsy is generally considered an inaccurate or even impolite term, but writers also wanted to throw in Roma characters as a mysterious magical force, you know, having them be fortune tellers and stuff, which is still an ethnic stereotype, still kind of frowned upon, just throwing that out there. Like, the Vampire Diaries even had them as villains for an entire season. Gypsies are here. Oh, I'm sorry. You call yourselves travelers now, right? I don't know what to do with this information other than to share it with you. So anyways, Rhonda reads their fortune. She tells Lissa, oh, you have a special destiny, etc. But Rhonda specializes in air, not spirit. So this was pointless. They fly back home and Rose's migraine returns yet again. And when the plane lands, it gets worse. More ghosts appear around her, which no one else can see, like dozens of them. We see Lissa's family, Mason, the kids from the Strigoi massacre, and Mason's ghost points to a portal off in the distance. It's the entrance to the land of the dead. The message is very clear. Rose shouldn't have come back to life, and now the underworld wants her. This is actually a very unsettling scene. Rose completely loses her shit, and the others, like, drag her off to the clinic on campus, and later, when she calms down a little, she explains what she saw. The doctor thinks that she has PTSD and recommends taking her off of the Guardian testing, but Rose refuses. She theorizes to herself that she gained a connection to the afterlife when she came back from the dead, but she still couldn't see ghosts, so really uh, it's been strengthened even further when she killed two people, and now that's why she can see them. And she has an epiphany and runs to their priest, Father Andrew. She, happen she asks what happened to Anna, St. Vladimir's shadow-kissed friend. And he tells her that after Vladimir died, Anna committed suicide. Lissa and Rose's bond is literally starting to drive Rose insane. Like, Lissa using her spirit powers is creating some darkness, and Rose is absorbing some of it. That's part of the reason why she's been acting aggressive and, I don't want to say out of character, because that actually fits pretty well with her, but that's why she's been more aggressive with everything lately. She finds Mason's ghost and talks to him a little bit, and while he doesn't talk back, he does respond to her by nodding or shaking his head. So later, they force her to go to counseling because of, you know, everything that's been going on, and the counselor asks Rose a bunch of questions about her guilt regarding Mason's death. She feels like she was, like Mason was there at that place because of him, and she dislikes that she didn't love him. She feels like maybe she owed him that because he was a good friend. You know, classic survivor's guilt type stuff. She doesn't tell the counselor about Dimitri, she just says there's another man in her life. And she does start to voice some resentment about always having to put her own desires aside for Lissa and other Moroi. Later, she hears about something called the mana, which is the Romanian word for hand. Or Wait, I'm sorry, how, how, how do I pronounce that? Muna. Oh, okay, Munya. Munyu, sure, whatever. Uh, Adrian tells her, that it's a secret society of royals. It doesn't really do anything, it's just a social club. Jesse and Ralph, the guys who were pretending that they were having sex with Rose back in the first book, tried to get Christian to join because they're both members. She also finds out that members of the Monu are beating people up. Rose doesn't know 
who's doing it exactly or why, but she does want to stop it. Adrian uses some compulsion on her to demonstrate the powers, because she's asking him what it's like, uh, and he uses it to ask her to kiss him, but he stops short. He was only doing it because she wanted to see what it was like. I snapped out of it instantly. The dreamy haze was gone, as was the yearning in my body. But I'd discovered something. Under compulsion, I had definitely wanted him to kiss me. Yet even under compulsion, it hadn't been the electric, all-encompassing feeling I had when I was with Dimitri. That feeling that we were practically the same person and were bound by forces bigger than both of us. With Adrian, it had simply been mechanical. She also realizes that the Munyu are uh, experimenting with compulsion and trying to get better at it. Then something else happens, because like I said, there aren't actual scenes in this book, it's just a constant flow of stuff happening. Rose realizes that the wards around the academy, and court, and a couple of other places, uh, are they keep out Strigoi because Strigoi are kind of dead, and so they should also keep out ghosts. At the royal court, she didn't see any ghosts, even though she was really stressed. So these aren't just stress-induced hallucinations. But she did see ghosts at the airport, which is outside the wards. And that, like, that's when she saw the dozens of them trying to call her back to the underworld. But she can see some ghosts when she's at school, meaning the wards are probably damaged somehow. She, she suggests this to Dimitri, who says, the wards are guarded and maintained all the time, so they would have noticed if something was happening. No one goes to double-check this. Brilliant security you got there, fellas. Over the next couple of days, no one attacks Rose or anyone near her. She realizes that the testers are going easy on her and she's annoyed because she wants practice. But Christian reassures her and tells her that she's going to be a great guardian, which if we're just talking about combat prowess, yeah, he, he's right, but she does need to learn to chill out and focus a lot more. We also get confirmation that Eddie does blame himself for Mason's death too, and Rose says that the two of them should probably both be in therapy, which, yes, they, they probably should. Their friend was violently murdered in front of them. They, they should work through that with a professional's help. So Jesse and Rolf try to get Lissa to join the Munyu, and they reveal that she knows that they know she uses compulsion, even though, I, I should mention, despite compulsion being used a lot in the series up to this point, it is forbidden. You can get in trouble for using it on people. And Lissa refuses, but Jesse and Ralph hint that they may know about the Queen's plot to marry her to Adrian. Lissa is shocked about this because apparently Rose never thought to tell her that, oh yeah, the Queen's gonna try and marry you off to Adrian at some point. Like, what, what the shit, Rose? That's the sort of thing you should let your friends in on. Anyways, they start getting forceful with Lissa, and Eddie makes them back off. Rose's counselor that she keeps going back to see has by this point, she's basically just taken on the role of Dr. Melfi from The Sopranos. You know, she, she's largely just there to have an excuse for the protagonist to voice their thoughts and feelings aloud to the audience without it feeling forced. But the thing is, these books are written in first person. You, you don't need an excuse to show the protagonist's thoughts. You can just have Rose say what she's thinking directly to the audience. You, you don't need the counselor. Anyway, she tells her that she doesn't mind guarding Lyssa, but she also knows that Dampier have no choice in the life that they live. I think it'd be useful if you stopped talking to me like I'm a Maroi. You act like I have choices, like I have the right to be upset about any of this or pick what classes I want to take. I mean, let's say I could choose them. What good would it do? What am I going to do with those classes? Go be a lawyer or a marine biologist? There's no point in me having my own schedule. Everything's already decided for me. She does confirm that she wants to be a guardian and she's not being forced, she just is kind of resentful about the fact that everything was chosen for her. Now, the counselor does think that she's seeing ghosts because of the stress of having to give things up for being a guardian, but by this stage, we and Rose do know that, yeah, that's, that's not what's happening. Now, during a fake attack, she fights off three guardians, including Dimitri as a fake Strigoi. Defeating Dimitri, it, it makes both of them weirdly horny because I don't know what it is, but paranormal romance, for some reason, it always has the love interests get weirdly horny over bizarre stuff. I, one of these days, I swear, I'm gonna read uh, about someone getting horny from watching their love interest put on a freaking jacket. So Christian confronts Adrian about his the plan to marry Lyssa, uh, because I, I don't know. Like, Adrian was unaware of it, and Christian, again, you should understand that, like, royal families, they do arrange marriages. You, you, I'm not sure what he's hoping to accomplish here, but he confronts him, and then Christian tries to hit him with a fireball, uh, but Rose saves him and prevents that from happening. Uh, turns out Ralph actually 
spread the rumors in order to start the fight. Now, through the bond, Rose sees Lyssa being attacked by the Manyu, and they start uh, torturing her using magic. So she runs over and stops them, but not before Lyssa uses compulsion to make Jesse hallucinate that there are spiders crawling all over him, and he just freaks out, starts scratching at his own skin. Everybody else just scatters in fear of Rose. <laughs> I'm not joking, they're all just terrified of her and they run away <laughs> immediately. But Lyssa, for whatever reason, can't stop the compulsion. There's, there's some sort of darkness in her taking over, and it's making her want to be sadistic and attack Jesse even more. So Rose takes on the darkness, but then is suddenly overcome by a desire to attack Jesse. So she jumps and attacks him. A bunch of people pull her off of him and Dimitri takes her away. She tries to get away and attack until Dimitri says, No! This isn't you! And then she calms down and realizes that the spirit magic is driving her nuts, just like Anna. And by this point, they've reached the cabin that they were at. Remember the random cabin that's just on campus for some reason? Yeah, they've reached that. Uh, and then the two of them have sex, and there's no mention of condoms, but I choose to hope that they used one. While walking back to everybody else, she sees Mason's ghost again, and he finally speaks. He just says, they're coming. And the warning isn't very much good because the Strigoi immediately attack them after that. <laughs> like, the book is now three quarters finished, so it's time to throw in a sudden action climax. Now is also a good time to mention that Rose, due to being shadow kissed, can sense Strigoi nearby. She feels a little bit nauseous when they're close. It's not a great early warning system, but it is an early warning system. So Dimitri stops to fight the Strigoi, and he sends Rose to the dorms with the code word Buria while he buys her some time. Not, not burial, autocorrect. I sw swear to God, autocorrect has been getting worse every freaking year, but no, not burial, Buria. It's apparently the Russian word meaning storm. So Rose gets back to campus and she warns the other guardians and they lock everything down. They like get everyone indoors and they get all the guardians out to start looking for Strigoi. They give Rose a silver stake because she really wants to help and they tell her to go watch over some Maroi at a dorm while guardians do more important stuff. And she realizes that it's busy work and is kind of mad about it, but she also realizes Christian is missing and she's supposed to be looking after him. So she jumps out a window and runs off to find him. She finds him really quickly, almost immediately actually, and then two Strigoi attack. And the two of them actually work together really well and they fight off the Strigoi. Christian hits them with fire as a distraction and then Rose finishes them off with a stake. Christian says, hey, we did a good job there, let's go fight more Strigoi. And Rose acknowledges that it's dumb, but other people need their help, so they go off and do it anyways. Nearby, there's a big battle with a bunch of Strigoi and a bunch of Guardians fighting, so they jump in. And a blonde Strigoi man shows up, and he apparently knows Rose, but she doesn't recognize him? They manage to kill most of the Strigoi and force the rest to flee, but they take several people with them as prisoners, including Eddie. So Rose says, hey, we need to go off and rescue those who are, have been taken. Her mom, Janine, also shows up on campus because she was nearby and the emergency happens, so they call in everybody. So she tells Dimitri, Rose tells Dimitri, that Mason's ghost might be able to guide them to those taken. So she goes outside the wards and brings out a map and has Mason point to a spot on it. According to Mason, there are some Strigoi hiding out in caves nearby. After some debate, the Guardians, they're, they're gonna go out no matter what, but they disagree on whether or not they should take Moroi with them and they decide, okay, if, if Moroi want to volunteer and come with us, they can come. They, you know, they're using fire and other magic to help them fight. Rose realizes also that the Manu's torture sessions using magic are what poked holes in the school's wards. You'd think that this would result in the kids doing it getting severely punished, but I don't think it ever really comes back up. It's just a brief, oh yeah, that's why there's holes in the wards. Now, Dimitri tells her that the two of them can be together, but only after she graduates. And he also says people will be upset about that because, you know, ch child grooming. Anyways, this huge group of guardians and Maroi attack the caves. Rose initially is just guarding an exit, but when others don't come out when they're supposed to, she goes in to help. I, I should also mention, this is during the daytime, so the Strigoi can't come out of the caves and fight them. They're, they're safe out there. And she realizes there was a cave in, which trapped a couple of people, but it didn't kill anyone. So Rose helps kill some Strigoi and save the other guardians that were trapped. They all fight their way out, but they take some casualties along the way, including Dimitri. He's taken down and bitten by the blonde Strigoi that recognized Rose earlier. Bleed me dry like a 
goddamn vampire! Rose freaks out upon seeing this and has to get dragged away. The sun has almost set by now, and they might not have enough time to hike back behind the wards. You know, they, they might not be able to get to safety before the sun sets. Will our brave heroes have to fight their way back to safety? Will they be ambushed in the dark woods by Strigoi? Will they take more casualties than, than they already have? Nope. The next chapter, they're already safe at school. It feels like a missed opportunity to me. So one captive that was taken was killed. The rest were all saved. So Eddie is okay. Uh, and it was done at the cost of six dead guardians, including Dimitri. So again, Eddie's okay. Rose has saved him twice now. He, he really owes her. Lissa helps with some of the wounded, and now everyone knows about her healing powers because they've still been keeping that kind of secret. Rose says that to Lissa, like she's kind of desperate, she says, hey, maybe you can bring Dimitri back if he's dead, but Lissa says that she doesn't think it's possible unless they died recently. And she also realizes around this time that, oh, okay, Ro Rose is in love with Dimitri. And at this point, I started thinking that one of two things would happen if Lissa tried to use her spirit powers on Strigoi. Either it would turn them back to normal, healing their death, or it would just hurt them. Kind of like undead in Dungeons and Dragons, when you hit them with healing magic, it causes damage. You know, one of those ideas was correct. I'll let you guess which. The others go to the caves and retrieve the bodies of everyone, but Dimitri and one other person are unaccounted for. So Rose goes out and finds Mason go Mason's ghost, and he confirms to her that Dimitri has been turned into a Strigoi. Now, earlier, before this, Rose and Dimitri both agreed that neither of them wanted to live like that. Dimitri straight up said he'd rather be dead than be a Strigoi. So a couple of days later, Rose asks Ad Adrian for money. She says that she is leaving the Academy, and maybe being away from Lyssa will help stop the darkening of her soul, plus her connection to the dead gets stronger as she kills more people. So she thinks that they're bond is going to be a negative it's going to have a negative effect on both of them adrian agrees he gives her his credit card and allows her to use it like remember he's a royal he has more money than he knows what to do with really so rose fills out some paperwork and goes to the headmistress and says that she is leaving she's 18 now so she can just she can drop out of school lissa tries to get her to stay but rose is going off to kill dimitri he because remember he would rather die than be a strigoi so she's going off to kill him and free him. It's not about you, okay? This time it's about me, not you. All my life, Lissa. All my life, it's been the same. They come first. I've lived my life for you. I've trained to be your shadow, but you know what? I want to come first. I need to take care of myself for once. I'm tired of looking out for everyone else and having to put aside what I want. Dimitri and I did that and look what happened. He's gone. I will never hold him again. Now I owe it to him to do this. I'm sorry if it hurts you, but it's my choice. She has clearly been holding that in for a while. This is definitely a situation where Rose is acting stupid, but I perfectly understand why she's acting stupid. You know, I, I don't want her to do it, but I get it. And that's kind of hard to pull off in writing, but it's also not a perfectly logical way to act. So that means it's a plot hole and this book is objectively bad. She walks off away from school and sees Mason's ghost one last time before he passes on forever, and that is the end of book three. Tomorrow. We have now reached day three of filming. Will I actually finish today? I don't know, I guess we'll see. So we reach book four, which is called Blood Promise, and this is simultaneously the best book in the series by a big margin, and a complete waste of time which you could skip over and not lose anything. It's kind of impressive that it manages to do both at the same time because you, you seriously could go from book three to book five and miss very little in the meantime. But it's also probably the most focused book in the series, at least in terms of plot, you know, because unlike the first three, which were mostly like teen drama stuff, not bad teen drama stuff, but teen drama stuff and then sudden action climax, this one is Rose searching for Dimitri so that she can kill him. And it's not out of revenge, which is how a story like this would usually go, it's to free him, because he would not want to be a Strigoi. It has issues, which we'll go over, but it is, again, really, really good. It's gripping. It has some of the best writing in the series. So we actually start off, and apparently Mason's ghost told Rose that Dimitri went to Siberia, which is where he's from. Like I said, he's Russian. And so now she's searching for him. She's in St. Petersburg. And I should mention now that Rose kind of speaks Russian, like not not really, but she did study it in school a lot, so she is familiar with the language at least. And you may be wondering, okay, now that she's outside the school's wards, shouldn't she be seeing ghosts all over the place? 
she's not. Uh, because willpower. Because, look, she just puts up mental barriers, and then the ghosts don't come through unless she wants them to. Shut up. So while searching around for Dimitri in Strigoi form, Rose has gone to a club. It's called the Nightingale. It's filled with vampires in imperial ball gowns, like they're in Tsarist Russia or something. And Rose also mentions that apparently she toured the Winter Palace recently, which is strange because I thought she was on a mission and searching for someone, but okay, sure, whatever. She leaves the club and she realizes she's being followed by someone. And if you're wondering why she's in St. Petersburg instead of Russia, it's because Dimitri told her the name of his hometown where she's from, but she can't remember what it is, and she ran off too quickly, and she can't ask anyone. <laughs> so now she's just looking around for random Dampier or Moroy that could maybe tell her where Dimitri is frickin' from. <laughs> so she found the Nightingale, which is a club where a bunch of Moroy hang out, and that's why she went in there. So. We're off to a great start. She asks some people where the town is and they get cagey and refuse to tell her. And you might be thinking, oh, why are they doing that? Is there some sort of big secret there? No, there's not. They're just refusing to tell her because it's, we need conflict in the story in this book, which is already way longer than it needs to be. So she nearly gets into a fight with a guardian and then she leaves. And then, like I said, someone's following her when she leaves. It is a human girl with a golden flower tattoo on her face. And that girl's name is Sydney. Now apparently, this all happened off screen in between books, but apparently while searching around the city, Rose has just run into a bunch of Strigoi and killed them, and has left their bodies all over the place, so people know exactly where she is. Sydney introduces herself and says that she is an alchemist. What is an alchemist? Rose doesn't know either. So a suddenly a Strigoi attacks and then Rose kills it, saving Sydney, and Sydney pours a vial of some substance over it which turns its body into dust. And she realizes, oh, okay, Rose really does have no idea what's going on, so she takes her out to eat briefly and then explain. And she explains to her that alchemists are humans who know about the Moroi and other vampires in the world, and they help them keep their secret. That's why they have the uh, magical get-rid-of-dead-bodies substance that they just carry around with them, apparently. Uh, and in exchange, they get the magic tattoos that Sydney has on her face. It's, it's not a tattoo made of ink, it's made of Moroi blood with some magic mixed in. It gives them traits of Moroi, like long life and disease resistance, but it also has compulsion in there, so it prevents them from revealing the secret of vampires to the world. Like, they literally cannot say anything to people who are not supposed to know it. But most Dampier are not told about alchemists until after they graduate from high school. For some reason. That reason being, the author didn't think of alchemists until she started writing this book, and then just decided to throw them in there. Sydney and the other alchemists are also generally thought of as religious extremists, which Sydney seems to back up because she says that all vampires are evil, but Strigoi are more evil than the others, which... You'd think they would follow up with that at some point in the series, but... Nope, they don't. I, I feel like I'm saying that a lot. Like, they, they keep bringing stuff up, which seems like it'll be important, but then it's just, they just kind of drop it. So she knows where Dimitri's hometown is, and she agrees to take Rose there. And apparently her bosses told her to take her there. She can't say why, she just says, yeah, my bosses wanted to, me to take you to the town. And Rose agrees. Apparently she was staying at a nice hotel nearby, and she bought a bunch of dresses to like, blend in at the Nightingale, remember, like, Tsarist-era ball gowns that she just bought, and she just leaves them at the hotel and doesn't take them with her or resell them or anything. Like, she, she's not good with money, and remember, all the money she has came from Adrian, who, he, he's not exactly hurting for it, and he didn't exactly work for it, he's a royal, but still, Rose, that's a shitty thing to do. Now, there's a parallel storyline going on with Lyssa, and it's not terrible, but it is a lot less gripping, and it doesn't take up a lot of the book. But anyways, through their bond, Rose sees that Lyssa is annoyed and being made to do errands for Queen Tatiana. She meets a man named Eugene Lazar, along with headmistress Kirova. The two of them are meeting together, because apparently Eugene is going to be the new headmaster. And Rose and Lyssa both think that Queen Tatiana is forcing people to put a royal headmaster in place because Kirova is not a royal and for whatever reasons they're doing some sort of power play here. Now, the new headmaster does have an assistant slash daughter whose name is Avery 
and he tells Lissa, hey, will you show Avery around? Uh, in other words, he wants Avery to always be nearby Lissa so that she can keep an eye on her and report back to her dad. And Lissa sees through that pretty quickly. And this is just the setup for that storyline. So we go back to Rose and Sydney. They take a train to Moscow. Rose goes on for literally several pages about all the buildings she sees and all the old Russian architecture and how Dmitri would have loved them, which, again, I would be fine with that, but it goes on for several pages. <laughs> and then Adrian visits her in a dream, and they chat a little bit, and he warns her, like, hey, be careful around the alchemists. They're religious nut jobs. Again, this doesn't come back, but he does warn her. And finally, they take another train, they arrive in Omsk, they buy a car, and they drive closer to their destination. Meanwhile, Lissa is actually becoming pretty good friends with Avery. You know, Lazar only brought her because, or at least according to Avery, her father Lazar only brought her because he wants to control her and he's afraid she'll run off with a human boy or something. And she does party a lot, though. So it seems, yeah, he's kind of right to worry about her. And she does seem to be a bad influence on Lissa. She gets her to go out and party and drink a lot more than she otherwise would have been doing. So while Sydney and Rose are on their long-ass road trip, they stay at the house of an alchemist, and they wake up to some Strigoi being nearby. Remember, Rose can sense them with her weird nausea powers. There are two of them, and then Rose kills both. But during the fight, her mental barriers come down, and she sees some ghosts, and they, they actually help her by distracting the Strigoi. Apparently, the Strigoi can also see ghosts, because... The ghosts that are around Rose, they just sort of swarm around the Strigoi and blind them for a second, and that allows Rose to attack. But the strain of this does cause Rose to pass out, and she wakes up in the next town over to someone tending her wounds, and the woman tells her that she's in the town of Baya, which is Dmitri's hometown. And this woman's name is Olena Belikova, Dmitri's mother. Yeah, conveniently, she just got taken to Dmitri's family while she was unconscious. Also, just uh, to clear up any confusion, uh, because if you're just watching this, you may not know this, and also the books don't really do a good job explaining it, but in Russia and other Slavic language-speaking countries, people can have masculine or feminine last names. So, like, Dmitri, his last name is Belikov, but his mom and sisters are all called Belikova. And it, it's the same name, it's just the masculine and feminine form of that name. And I might be simplifying or misunderstanding something. If I got it wrong, feel free to correct me down below. But that is my understanding of it, and I wish the books had taken just a brief moment to explain that. Rose thinks this is a little bit awkward, so she's kind of vague about why she's there, and the others don't press the issue. And they actually mention Dimitri because apparently they don't know he's dead. <laughs> no one, like, picked up the phone and called them about this. Which, like, yikes, guys, seriously, why would you not do that? But Rose does explain the situation to them and says, like, hey, there was a battle and now he is a Strigoi. Dimitri's mom and sisters are upset about this, understandably so, but Rose does not tell them that she's there to kill him. It is revealed pretty quickly that she was in a relationship with him, but everyone is just kind of okay with that, which I don't know what that says about Russia, or what the author thinks of Russia, but it, it says something. I don't know why she's keeping the secret that she's there to kill him, it, because it's important, and they would probably be fine with it. Like, again, he's a Strigoi. They already view him as dead. And plus, they would probably be even more willing to help her than they already are if they knew that. After all, she made a blood promise. So Sydney tells Rose that there is a local important guy who is looking for her. He is a businessman. Let, note the quotes around that word. He's a businessman. Well... Okay, he, he does apparently do some legal business, but he also does a lot of illegal business. And he has connections to high-ranking people in the Moroi world and high-ranking people in the alchemists. Uh, they call him Zmei, which is apparently the Russian word for snake, but only behind his back, not to his face. Now, this Abe fellow, why is he looking for Rose? And on whose behalf? We don't know exactly. He's doing it on behalf of someone important, but we aren't sure at this stage. Anyways, Abe shows up at Dimitri's funeral, and he gets this picture, because, sure, why not? Like, who else would you think of when you hear the name Abe? Possibly someone else, but I don't care. At 
Dimitri's funeral, Abe asks Rose why she's there, and he said and says he'll tell her why he's looking for her eventually, but nothing really comes of it. And during the ceremony, she gets very drunk. It's I, I don't want to sound culturally insensitive or anything, but apparently at Russian funerals, people drink a lot, which is understandable, and Rose isn't used to this much alcohol. And people realize, like I said, that she was in a relationship with Dimitri, but they say nothing of it. Uh, they realize the age gap, which is not that big a deal on its own, but the teacher-student thing, I, I don't know if they understand that. Whatever, the point is they realize it and they don't say anything. The next morning, uh, Dimitri's grandmother, whose name is Yeva, uh, enlists Rose to help her with some thing. I'm, I'm like, there's too many pictures here. I'm losing track of which ones to point at. Dimitri's grandmother enlists Rose to help her with some stuff. Uh, specifically, she wants to return some stuff to their neighbors. Their neighbors are a married couple whose names are Oksana and Mark. And Oksana is a Moroi woman, and Mark is a dampier man, and they're married, and that's very, very rare. They are also bonded the same way Rose and Lissa are. And apparently Oksana is a spirit user and she can also read minds, so she can tell that Rose is on a mission of revenge. It's not really revenge when you think about it, but whatever, that's what she says. And privately, Mark tells Rose that tons of other Dampier go rogue like her. They either hunt Strigoi or they just become bodyguards for hire. But it's kept quiet because the royals don't realizing that the Dampier have options besides serving their entire lives. Once again, this seems like a detail that would be a lot bigger, but no, it's, it's just kind of mentioned in passing and it's important for a little while and then they just move on. Mark tells Rose that her journey is a bad idea and she's gonna wind up getting herself killed. And he suggests having Lyssa heal the darkness inside her because apparently that's doable via the bond, like Mark and Oksana do that, but it does limit Oksana's powers quite a bit. So he gives her, Rose, a ring that's been enchanted by Oksana in order to heal her. It's supposed to help a bit and just keep the darkness at bay. And by now, Sydney has already left. She's back to St. Petersburg. She apologizes, but the alchemists have already called her back to her post. Now, meanwhile, Christian is trying to teach other Moroi to fight with magic and not having much luck with it. One of the Moroi he's teaching is Jill. And Adrian is there as well, and he gives Jill the charming nickname of Jailbait, which is... It's supposed to be fun or cute, but it just comes across as creepy. You know, like that the term Jailbait is kind of creepy to begin with, but calling a 14-year-old girl that to her face is creepy. Now, we're back in Baia again, and I'll just say right now, Rose spends like a hundred pages of this book just chilling in Baia, in Dimitri's hometown not actually doing anything to advance the plot or go closer to her overall goal of finding Dimitri and killing him. She is just hanging around here for a hundred frickin' goddamn pages. And once we're back there, uh, Rose is being weirdly judgmental about Dampier girls who live in this town, and she looks down on several of them as blood whores, even though she spent the whole series up until this point raging about Moroi treating Dampier girls as sex objects. You know, they're demanding sexual availability from them, but also looking down on them for being sexually available. Like, Ro Rose has been raging ag against that for the whole series, but all of a sudden now she's the one going after other girls and calling them blood whores. But don't worry, though. None of Dimitri's families are sluts. They just have several children out of wedlock. But it's different when they do it, because shut up. Mark, for some reason, suggests to Rose that she just stay in Baia, and live with Dimitri's family? Like, forever? He just suggests that to her? Why the fuck would you suggest that? That's a really fucking dumb thing to say? <laughs> Under basically any circumstances? Like, Rose was just here to chill for a little bit and then move on and find Dimitri? Like, why would she stay? What reason would she have for it? I don't know, but Mark suggests that. <laughs> he also tells Rose that ghosts hate Strigoi because Strigoi are unnatural. They're neither alive nor dead. But he also says you really shouldn't summon them on purpose unless uh, otherwise bad things might happen. And once again, that sounds like foreshadowing, but no. Disappointed! So then Abe appears, kind of out of nowhere, which he does several times in this book, and they have a repetitive conversation. He's like, why are you here? Leave before bad things happen to you, etc. 
not, again, she, she's really doing nothing for about 100 pages here. Then Adrian appears to her in a dream, and he mentions Avery in kind of a, but remember, Lissa's friend slash guide slash whatever, the new headmaster's daughter. Uh, he mentions her in kind of a romantic way, and Rose kind of lashes out in jealousy. She feels like her friends are moving on without her, and she's only been gone a couple of weeks at this stage, which, like... Oh, okay, I guess. If it, they spent a little bit more time on her feeling this way, it might come across better, but here it just seems like she's being kind of snippy for no reason. And then Adrian tells her that she won't, that he won't visit her anymore. The next day is Easter, and I, I assume they mean Christian Orthodox Easter, which is by a different calendar than the rest of Christians, but whatever. The next day is Easter, and someone mentions that Abe actually left town on business, and that they just mention offhandedly that they think he's Muslim, so he doesn't celebrate Easter. My immediate thought upon hearing that was, oh, okay, he's Rose's dad. Because remember, her dad's name is Ibrahim? That's the Turkish form of Abraham, and Abe is short for Abraham. And they also mention that her dad was probably Muslim, or at least Rose thinks that he was probably Muslim, and the way he's described, he seems kind of possibly Turkish. Like, and spoiler alert, I was correct. I do like how the twist is handled, though, because the puzzle pieces are all there. It's just easy to miss them the same way that Rose misses them, because she doesn't learn until, like, the very end of the book that, oh, Abe is her dad. Like, we're wondering, well, why is this guy looking for her? Why is he trying to help her out? Like, it's because he's her dad. Like, he's, he's a shitty dad, but he does care about her. Anyway, she meets another guy named Dennis. At least I think I'm pronouncing that right. It might be Denise or something. Uh, but he is one of the independent Strigoi hunting Dampier, who, you know, d decided not to become a guardian. He's just going out and hunting Strigoi by himself. Now, uh, again, Rose isn't actually looking for Dimitri at this stage. She's just sort of existing in a way that a decent editor would have cut down on. So anyways, De De Dennis, Denise, taunts her, saying that Dimitri died for people who didn't deserve his services, which is kind of correct, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Uh, and he mentions that he and his friends are going to Novosibirsk to hunt Strigoi, which is a, a town in Siberia. Now, Rose doesn't want to go with him because we need conflict. So she just doesn't agree to this, and she just hangs around for a little bit longer. After all, who would want to watch Rose be reckless and dive into danger while grieving? Who would want her to see her go to the ends of the earth to put the man she loves to rest? Not like that was the whole setup for this fucking book or anything. It, like, it's much more interesting for her to sit around and do fuck all in the middle of rural Siberia. It, it, seriously, it's like she fucking forgot that she's supposed to be looking for Dimitri or something. Anyways, that night, uh, one of Dimitri's younger sisters, her name is Victoria, goes to a club where Moroi boys are partying with Dampier girls. Again, kind of, sort of, just viewing them as blood horrors, as sex objects, and it's not even implied, but just pretty much said right out that they're gonna have easy sex with some of them and then just fuck off into the ether whether they're pregnant or not. Rose tries to get Victoria not to go at first because she doesn't want anything bad to happen to her, but Victoria's gonna go anyway, so Rose just goes with her to keep an eye on her. And apparently the guy that is going after her that night, who Victoria is also super into, also got her sister pregnant. Yeah, like Dimitri has another younger sister who is currently pregnant at this time and no one else knows who the dad is, but Abe tells Rose that, yeah, it's the same guy. and. He thinks of having sex with all of the Belikov sisters as, like, a game. That's weird. Vampire Academy has a lot fewer just strange head-scratching moments than other book series that I've done this with, but that's not to say it doesn't have any. So Abe appears and he reiterates to Rose that Victoria is going to be used and tossed aside, possibly pregnant, and that will damage her life going forward. And he says that if Rose leaves Baya right now, then he will scare the boy off. And Rose agrees, because in her mind, she's like, okay, he's telling me to go home, but I'm only agreeing to leave Baya. So after this, she does go to Novosibirsk. Like I said, 25% of this book could easily be cut off. So uh, Abe just sends one of his goons in, he scares the boy off, and then Victoria is really mad, and her and Rose leave. Meanwhile, Lissa is having a bad time at court. Meanwhile, Lissa is having a bad time at court. I don't really need to elaborate, she's just having a bad time and not getting along with the other royals. So the next day, Rose's, Rose meets Dimitri's grandmother on the street, and apparently she speaks English now. I shot up. All this time you've been pretending not to? 
You've been making Paul play translator? Paul is Dimitri's nephew. It's easier, she said simply. You avoid a lot of annoying conversation when you don't speak the language, and I've found that Americans make the most annoying conversation of all. <laughs> okay, that, that's pretty funny. So Grandma says that she knows Rose is there to find Dimitri, or Dimka as she calls him, it's a nickname. Uh, she knows that she's there to find him and kill him, and she's fine with it. There wasn't really a point to that conversation, but at least it did have that funny line in it. So Rose joins up with Dennis, and they all drive off to Novosibirsk. Their group manages to catch a Strigoi and torture him for a bit to see if he knows where Dimitri is, and Rose specifically mentions that the problem with torturing information out of people is there's no real way to verify it, which, yes, that is the problem with torture as an interrogation technique. All studies into torture as an interrogation technique have backed this up. So they kill the first Strigoi, and then they capture, torture, and kill a few more until they come across one who does know Dimitri. And they let him go and saying, hey, find Dimitri and tell him that Rose Hathaway is looking for him. Also, Rose is this group's leader now. I mean, I, I, I guess she is really good at killing Strigoi, so it's not the strangest thing, but still. Meanwhile, Lissa kisses her ex-boyfriend Aaron in a, quote, friendly way, because we need conflict to pad this book out further. Now, uh, while Rose is walking around on the street by herself, Dimitri just suddenly appears and knocks her unconscious. And then she wakes up in a very nice locked room somewhere. She's on a high floor in a building way out in the middle of nowhere. Again, they're in Siberia, outside of a couple major cities. There's fucking nothing out there for many miles. Dimitri enters the room and she tries to fight him with very little luck. She throws a chair at him, he just smacks it aside. And he says they're on an estate owned by his old teacher, whose name is Galena. And Galena turned herself Strigoi a while ago. So he offers to turn Rose Strigoi, that way the two of them can both be immortal and be together forever, and Rose refuses, obviously. Uh, the Strigoi, the blonde one from the last book who actually captured Dimitri and turned him, his name is Nathan, and he's at this estate too. He dislikes Rose and wants to kill her. Dimitri is also a lot different than he was before. Like, he just seems colder and kind of sociopathic and mentions that he has killed a lot of people while feeding on them. Bleed me dry like a goddamn vampire. They're missing out. It's incredible, he breathed. He closed his eyes for a moment, then opened them. To drink the blood of another, to watch the life fade from them and feel it pour into you, it's the greatest experience in the world. So you can see, this is a very far cry from the Dimitri of before, who was, you know, obsessed almost with protecting those who couldn't protect themselves. However, in spite of his changes, he does still love Rose, and he wants to turn her Strigoi, but he wants to turn her of her own free will. He wants to convince her this is the way to go about it, so that he can turn her. So he's kind of himself, but not really. You know, like I said, when people turn Strigoi, it just turns them sociopathic. They kiss a bit until she feels his fangs with her tongue and remembers like, oh yeah, the real Dimitri is dead, I'm here to kill him. And then she pushes him away, and he feeds on her a bit, and it feels amazing for her. Which is kind of weird, if you ask me. Like, it feels good when Maroi feed on people, yeah, but I think it would have been neat if it was painful instead, or at least somehow different, so it's not exactly the same as when Maroi feed on people. You know, it would emphasize that Strigoi are unnatural, and that the Dimitri she loved is gone but, you know, it feels exactly the same. So the two of them spend a couple of weeks together, with Rose trapped in this cell and Dimitri coming and going as he please. They, they don't have sex, but they do cuddle and stuff, and Rose also just chills in the room when he's not around. Uh, he brings her jewelry, and she compares him to Abe, like, very favorably compares him to Abe. You know, like, so she's dating this older man and comparing him to her absent father. That's, that, that's interesting. Okay, technically she doesn't know he's her dad yet, but it does still need to be mentioned. So Dimitri tells her to stay away from Abe because he's dangerous. And again, we know he's some sort of crime boss, but we never get much detail about it, so it's hard to feel much of anything one way or another. Like, he, he just is a crime boss. What sort of de nasty, dangerous stuff does he do? Don't worry about it. He's just a crime boss and you need to stay away from him. So she still refuses to be turned, so Dimitri takes her outside. On the way, they run into Nathan, and Nathan insists that she's just food. They also see the Strigoi that Rose tortured and let go earlier. Her name is Marlene. And then they run into Galena, who is like the leader of this band of Strigoi. 
and she says that Demetri, you have very little time left with Rose. Either you turn her or we will eat her very quickly. And Dimitri does confirm that, yeah, Rose, I'm going to turn you soon, whether you want to or not. You only have a couple of days left. And she sees Adrian in a dream, and he asks her to come back, but she is so high from recently being fed on that she doesn't really feel like it. And Adrian notices her aura is weird and sees bite marks, so he knows something is wrong, but she wakes herself up before she can explain anything. Later, Nathan comes to her and he says, Hey, where's Lyssa? And because he wants to wipe out the Dragomir line so he can be Galena's lieutenant again. Apparently he was Galena's lieutenant beforehand and then Dimitri came along and he's more powerful so he took his place. And it's just... Nathan is a very minor antagonist but his role is kind of weird because he wants to turn Rose. He wants to find and kill Lyssa. He wants to kill Rose and he also wants to have sex with Rose. Like it's... I don't know, a very focused, very well-developed minor villain we have here. Anyways, uh, she punches him, and then she takes the human serving lady hostage, because there, there's a couple of human servants running around here, and tries to escape. <clears throat> but Rose's mistake is that she assumes the serving lady is there uh, being forced to be there, like she's a slave or something, but no, she's actually there of her own free will. Uh, the lady escapes her grip, because Rose is kind of weak from blood loss, and then she stands between her and Nathan, actually taking on like a protective pose, saying, hey, don't you try and hurt him. And Rose thinks it's weird that a human would care about a Strigoi like that. And the, again, this never really goes anywhere. So Dimitri arrives, diffusing the situation, but Nathan makes it clear he wants Rose gone. However, while they're arguing, she does overhear that her silver stake is still on the estate. She doesn't let Dimitri feed on her anymore, and he says that there are two days until he turns her whether she wants to or not. She starts having withdrawals from being bitten because... Uh, look, being bitten is like simultaneously a sexual thing and a metaphor for drug use in this series. It's, it's strange. The withdrawals don't affect her that much though. Meanwhile, Lyssa goes back to the academy and Christian is really mad that she kissed her ex-boyfriend Aaron. And Lyssa tries to play it off, but he is upset with her and... That, that's understandable. What she did was kind of bad. And then Rose is forced out of Lissa's head by some unseen force. And then Rose and Dimitri talk about her visit with his family. <laughs> Again, this section of the book, it's not bad, but it goes on longer than it should. And then meanwhile, again, Lissa gets in trouble for having a party in the school's library, and she's drinking a lot, and Rose is starting to get concerned with her. And then she goes into a session with the school's counselor, who is concerned because her self-destructive behavior, her mental problems, etc. But Lissa dodges all the questions, and then Christian breaks up with her. Oh my goodness. So Avery comforts Lissa while she's upset about Christian breaking up with her, and then she looks her directly in the eyes and forces Rose out of Lissa's head, because it turns out Avery is a spirit user. R remember when those were so rare that most people didn't even realize they exist? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Rose is unsure what sort of manipulation Avery is trying to play with Lyssa and Adrian, but she realizes that nothing good is going on, and if she wants to help her friends, she's going to have to get out of here and also kill Dimitri, because that's what she came here for in the first place. So she realizes that uh, the chair she threw at Dimitri the first day and he knocked aside has a crack in it, and so she's able to break off the leg and it has a sharp end, so it ha it'll make a makeshift, makeshift stake. When the serving lady brings her food, Rose attacks her, and she manages to like hold the sharp end of the stake to her neck so she gets the door code and can open it, but when Dimitri approaches, uh, she knocks out the serving lady and then hides her unconscious body. She talks to Dimitri a little bit, realizes that he wants to turn her because he wants to possess her. Like, the old Dimitri is gone completely. So she stabs him in the heart with her stake, and it's, it's not a silver stake, so... It doesn't kill him, it just incapacitates him for a few minutes, but it gives her time to uh, leave, lock the door behind her. But as soon as she leaves, she runs into Nathan, and he attacks her, but he was Maroi before he turned into Strigoi, so he's not actually very good at fighting, and she is able to hold her own. She manages to get him into her room and then close the door behind him, and he doesn't know the code, so he's stuck in there. Now, as she's trying to leave, she runs into yet another human servant, and she demands he take her to the vault, which he does. Uh, she opens it with a key that she took from Dimitri, and then she finds her silver stake inside, along with some other magic artifacts, which she doesn't bother touching. Now, when she's trying to leave, she runs into Galena, and she's nearly killed, but then Dimitri, who is now recovered and was able to break out of the cell, or 
I, actually, I think he just knew the door code. Whatever. He has recovered, and he's left the cell, and he arrives and attacks Galena, and he just holds her in place long enough for Rose to stake her. And he, he did this on purpose, by the way. And then other Strigoi arrive, and Rose runs while Dimitri is holding them back. And Dimitri manages to kill them all without too much trouble, and as Rose is running away, remember they're in the middle of nowhere, so there's just woods all around her, and while she's running through the woods, Dimitri calls out to her. He tells her that he killed the others and thanks for helping. He says that now they can rule Galena's old empire together, and Rose realizes, okay, I'm not going to be able to uh, run faster than him. He'll track me down eventually, so she decides to ambush him in the trees. And she does, but then he fights her off and she doesn't kill him or even hurt him that badly. Normally, she wouldn't be able to fight Dimitri as well as she's doing, but he is tired and kind of beat up. Again, he got stabbed in the heart not long ago. He had to fight several other Strigoi. He's, he's running on fumes. He catches her and is about to forcibly turn her, but she takes off her ring and manages to summon some ghosts. And they surround Dimitri, they blind him and confuse him, and instead of taking the chance to kill him, Rose just runs away. Not sure why. She climbs to the top of a nearby bridge, and he catches her again. But she goes over to the edge and threatens to jump because under no circumstances does she want to live as a Strigoi. And Dimitri comes too close, so she jumps, and he catches her with one arm and starts hauling her up. Uh, but that leaves an opening, so Rose is dangling with one arm, she has her stake in the other arm. She says that she loves him, and she plunges the stake into his heart. And then Dimitri falls off the bridge, he falls into the river, and he dies. Just like that. I'll say right now, this scene is the best in the entire series by a big margin. It's, it's the best part of the entire series, bar none, because it's the culmination of all of Rose's effort this entire book. You know, it breaks her heart, but it needed to be done. You know, she's not killing the man she loves, she's freeing him. Kind of like at the end of Old Yeller when they have to shoot Old Yeller. Surely, surely, after writing a scene this good, the author isn't going to backtrack and make it seem completely pointless in retrospect. Surely she won't do that. Some people drive by on a road and Rose hitchhikes back to the city. Abe finds her and he is annoyed that she's still in Russia, but like I said, his deal with her was for her to leave Baya, not to go home, so she did keep her end of it. And Mark and Oksana are there too, because we need them for the climax. And Rose says, hey, Lissa's in danger and I need to help her. She goes into her head and she sees Avery <clears throat> making Lissa get really drunk and dance near an open window high off the ground and then Avery notices she's there and forces her out of her mind again. With Oksana's help, Rose manages to reactivate the bond and she's able to communicate with Lyssa and she can't just be forced out of her head. She tells her, hey, Avery's an enemy, you need to resist, because now the, the bond goes both ways. Rose can actually communicate with her a little bit. But Avery makes Rose hallucinate. She makes her see herself living with Dimitri and she's like, oh man, I wish this was my life, but she pulls free. So by this point, Avery and her brother Reed are just straight up trying to push Lissa out the window. It confirms at some point they're trying to kill her so that Avery can resurrect her with a bond and then do some sort of evil royal political plot. I I'm not sure. Via the bond, Rose tells Lissa how to fight. She tells her, okay, like, uh, how here's how you make a fist punch like that. And she's able to fight off uh, Avery's brother Reed because he's not very good at this. But then a guardian comes in to try and help finish her, but then Adrian comes along, finally, at the last second, and he uses compulsion on the guardian. And there's some more back and forth in this fight, but with Lyssa, Adrian, and Oksana pouring spirit into this guardian, he passes out, and Avery is hurt by the massive amount of spirit energy too, because it turns out that she is bonded with her brother Reed and with that guardian. She brought them both back from the dead. and. All that spirit energy getting pushed into them just makes them all pass out. So the fight is over and Rose goes back to normal. And Oksana mentions that she knows someone who claimed to heal a Strigoi. Like she claims somehow he was able to bring a Strigoi back and make them normal again. And this guy's name is Robert Doru. He's the illegitimate half-brother of Victor Dashkov. And Rose says, well, where is this Robert Doru guy? And Oksana says, only one person knows where he is, Victor. And Rose is like, well, that sucks, but right now I need to focus on helping Lyssa. So she asks Abe to send her home. 
And he does, and he gives her a scarf as she leaves. When Rose eventually arrives back at St. Vladimir, she hears that Avery and the others literally went insane from spirit overload, and they have just been committed to a mental institution. And also, the new headmaster is gone, and headmistress Karova is back in charge again. So her and Lissa see each other, she apologizes for the way they left things, and Rose tells her the whole story of killing Dimitri, and then she re-enrolls in school. Remember, this is like a couple of weeks before she's due to graduate, <laughs> but uh, Headmaster Lazar, like I said, is gone, and someone, who's pretty obviously Abe, threatens to withhold a substantial uh, monetary donation if Rose isn't allowed to go back to class and graduate. Rose also runs into Janine, and Janine is glad to see her, and she notices the scarf that she's wearing that Abe gave her, and she points out that, oh hey, that belonged to Ibrahim. And this is when she confirms that Abe is her father. And she says that he's a wonderful man who has never been caught doing anything illegal. Interesting choice of words, but that, that's what she says. But never going into exactly what Abe does as an organized crime boss means that he gets to be dark and edgy and mysterious without any of the moral complexity that might make the audience dislike him. Just like every fucking mafia romance. This is when we learn that Abe wasn't hired to find her by somebody, he did it on his own. Like I said, he's a shitty dad, he didn't even meet his daughter until she was 18, but he does care about her. So Adrian asks Rose out, and she doesn't say yes, but she is amenable to it. You know, it seems like, okay, she, she really is moving on from Dimitri. And Abe sends her a message, because she was asking about uh, Victor and his mysterious brother Robert, and Abe sends a message saying that he sent a message to Victor in prison, but he won't say where his brother is. And Rose also realizes, like, okay, there's nothing we can offer him and nothing we can threaten him with. But she also receives a letter from Dimitri. He fucking, he survived. Hold on. Like, it's not that I mind having shirtless Alan Richson on my wall, but still, like, that was, that was, that was a big moment, and, and now it's worthless. Yeah, it turns out that Rose missed Dimitri's heart when she stabbed him, which I guess makes sense. Like, again, she's hanging by one hand and trying to stab upward with the other. Like, sure, it makes sense that she missed him, but he survived, and then he just sends the stake back along with a letter, and like I said, just like that, the amazing death scene means nothing. But Rose can't do anything about it because she promised her mom that she would graduate, so there's no action until then. But in her head, she plans to break Victor out of prison, and then use him to find Robert and bring Dimitri back to life. And Lissa agrees to help her, and that's the end of book four. Then we reach book five, the second to last book, Spirit Bound. Dimitri keeps sending Rose threatening letters. You know, he's saying, hey, I'm gonna kill you as soon as I get the chance. He's gonna get a visit from HR, I swear. Also, I'm not sure why the school is sending these letters through. You'd think they just catch them and destroy them. Because, you know, just having a grown man send death threats to a teenage girl who is a, their student, that, that feels like something they'd want to stop. Just throwing that out there. But Rose is finally taking her guardian trial, which is like the final thing you need to do to graduate and become a full guardian. Basically, it's a big obstacle course that you have to fight through. And there to watch her are, you know, all her friends at school, but also Janine and Abe. And she thinks that Abe is going to be a bad influence on Adrian because... On her behalf, Adrian is trying to quit drinking and smoking because he likes her enough to try and give up his vices to, on her behalf. I'm sure she's just as willing to make sacrifices for him. <laughs> so Rose does really well during the trial and her mom actually congratulates her for it. Basically, she is protecting a Maroi from a Strigoi, again, it's just someone pretending to be a Strigoi, uh, attacking them on a rickety bridge and then she cuts the bridge to make them fall. And everyone's like, wow, that's really impressive and smart. Good job, Rose. So she gets another tattoo on her neck, and now she's an official, official guardian. And Adrian kisses her in celebration, and she's okay with it, because they're kind of ish dating now. At the graduation party, Rose kind of laments that Lissa and Christian broke up due to the events of the last book. And by now, Christian does know about Avery's manipulation, but it doesn't take away what Lissa did to him. You know, she did kiss her old boyfriend, and she did say some unpleasant things to him. But Rose finds Abe and tells him off for flirting with every woman in sight and also for jokingly threatening Adrian. Which, eh, as far as 
that goes like jokingly threatening your daughter's boyfriend is not that big a deal. He laughs it off, tells her that her guardian test was more intense than everyone else's because she has shown so much aptitude already. And she thanks him for getting a message to Victor and asks where his prison is. And this is where Abe tells her that the prison he's in is called Tarasov, or Tar Tarasov, maybe. Uh, it actually moves around, depending on the time of year, you know? Like, during summertime in the northern hemisphere, it's up there, because it's holding vampires. It is more difficult for them to escape if there's always sunlight. And then during wintertime up here, it moves to the southern hemisphere. Right now, it's in Alaska, but Abe doesn't know exactly where it is. The information regarding that would be at the Guardian headquarters. Luckily, Guardian headquarters is at court. And Rose, Lissa, Eddie, and Adrian are all moving to court. Yeah, you, you remember Eddie? Yeah, he's, he's relevant again. And they're all mo moving to court in Pennsylvania, so they're like, okay, sure, that sounds like a good idea. Now, when they arrive, they actually run into Mia, who lives there. And ever since their near-death experience with the Strigoi, Mia has been a lot nicer. She has not really done anything again up until now, but she is nicer to Rose and the others. She's matured a bit. And she tells Rose where some records are, and those records might have the location of Tarasov. Adrian also tells Rose that he wants her to meet his parents. He's not being let in on the prison breakout uh, idea. But he wants her to meet his parents, which seems to be saying that he's actually pretty serious about her. And Rose agrees to this, despite trying to bring her old boyfriend back to life. Alright, that doesn't make her seem like she's using Adrian at all. So she goes to meet his parents, they're royals, so they're pretty condescending. Adrian makes a joke about marrying Rose one day and having kids with her, and they are not at all pleased. Or at least his dad is, and his mom doesn't seem to care that much. And then Queen Tatiana actually arrives at their dinner and is there for a bit. But she's really cordial, despite her earlier interactions with Rose. Uh, and after dinner, Adrian's mom tells Rose that her and Adrian probably won't settle down together. They're incompatible long term. You know, Rose being herself, being someone who wants to be a guardian, probably isn't going to settle down and stay at home to raise kids. <clears throat> and also, Adrian has other duties as a royal. So long term, they're probably not going to be a thing together. And Rose does agree. So that's why his mom isn't really panicking about, oh no, he's dating a lower class girl. So Rose, Lissa, and Mia all go to the Guardian headquarters to steal the files on Tarasov. Now, Lissa compels, compels a guard to let them into a restricted area, and Rose grabs some documents and then runs into another Guardian. His name is Mikhail, and coincidentally, he was in love with Miss Karp. Do, do you remember the teacher who turned Strigoi to avoid going insane from way back in book one? Like, yeah, M Mikhail was in love with her at the time, and he actually went off and abandoned his duties to try and track her down and kill her the same way Rose did to Dimitri, but he wasn't unable to find her and eventually he gave up and came crawling back. But he, when he hears about Rose's mission and what she's trying to do, he decides, you know what, Th this girl's doing exactly what I did, but she might actually succeed at it, so he just lets her go, which is awful convenience. You know, if they had run into literally any other guard, that wouldn't have worked. They find the location of Tarasov from the files, and so later Mikhail actually helps to smuggle uh, Lissa, Rose, and Eddie out of court so that they can take a plane to Alaska. I'm not sure why Eddie is coming along with them, because like, yeah, he does owe Rose, she saved his life, but at the same time, he doesn't have a great track record when it comes to running off with his friends. So they land in Fairbanks, Alaska, they rent a car, and the prison is pretty close nearby, so they stake it out for a bit. Lissa makes a bunch of spirit charms that alter their appearance, and if need be, they can also use them to compel people, because spirit powers can do that now. And they drive a truck in, and they pretend to be bringing a delivery. Basically, they found an old requisitions form to copy, and uh, Eddie is pretending to be a delivery guy, and Lissa and Rose are pretending to be human feeders that will you know, go in so that they can be fed on by the prisoners. But they're all in disguise, that way even if their spirit charms don't work, then people won't immediately recognize them. However, the requisitions form they found is old, so they get sent to the warden's office to get it sorted out. And Eddie waits there while the feeders are taken to be fed on. While they're in the room where all the feeding happens, Lissa compels a guard to have Victor brought in uh, a little bit earlier than he normally would. And as soon as Victor is brought in, he recognizes Rose. 
and as he's leaning over to feed on her, she whispers to him to attack her. And he does. He acts like he's suddenly going crazy and attacking her. And then the guards move in to stop him, and Rose turns and attacks them. And with Rose attacking, along with Lissa using some compulsion and the element of surprise, they manage to subdue the guards and they get Victor out of there. They also stop by the security office to smash shit up and erase their footage. And then on the way out, they grab Eddie, but someone manages to pull an alarm, so they barely manage to get in their rental car and drive off while people are shooting at them. This sequence is actually pretty good. Yeah, I don't have a lot to complain about here. So after they break Victor out, uh, he's like, Hey, not that I don't appreciate it, but why the fuck are you helping me all of a sudden? And they tell him, Hey, we want to know where your brother is. We got to ask him about a few things. And they ask him, So where, where's your brother? Where's Robert? And he says, We need to go to Las Vegas. Victor has no ID, because again, he's just escaped from prison. So they have to charter a private plane out of Alaska because they have enough money for that. Again, they're, they're literally just using Adrian's credit card to do all of this. In Vegas, they stay at the Luxor Hotel, and Victor calls his brother Robert to meet them that night. But, like I said, they used Adrian's credit card, so they find out where... <clears throat> he finds out where they are pretty quickly. And then he just pops up at the room and says, Hey, you thought you could party without me? Before he notices Victor. And by now, news of the prison break has gotten out, so Adrian is just standing there like, Uh... Guys, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> it's, that, it's actually a pretty funny scene. So Rose explains what she's doing. She broke him out of prison, you know, this dangerous criminal. She broke out of prison so that she can find his brother, and then she can talk to his brother and maybe use information he has to maybe possibly bring her ex-boyfriend back to life. And Adrian is upset with her, rightfully so, I would say. Like, she's going back to her old boyfriend, she's using his money to do it, and she's not telling him about it. So, like, yeah, I, I can understand why he'd be upset with her. And Rose snaps at him, and he leaves to go drink and smoke some more, which seems to be saying, like, okay, he, he doesn't really care about being on her good side right now. And then Robert arrives, and they all get to meet him, and he's a bit weird, like, again, using spirit powers has taken a toll on his mental state, but overall he seems like a decent fellow, so I figure Robert Pattinson. That's, that's a good choice, right? I like Robert Pattinson. He's cool. So like I said, Robert is unstable from using spirit for many years, and apparently he also had a bond with someone that he brought back from the dead, but then they died again. And he immediately recognizes Rose and Lissa's bond. He can tell that they are spirit bound. And Robert tells them that in order to heal a Strigoi, you have to kill them with a silver stake. Because normal silver stakes have the four elements mixed in there, earth, wind, fire, water, uh, but a spirit one can actually heal Strigoi instead of just kill them. Basically, you just pour a bunch of spirit into it beforehand. Uh, I think magic is kind of vague in these books. Uh, and then it, it has to be wielded by the spirit user. If you stab them in the heart, it will heal them. Which means that either Lissa or Adrian would have to be the ones to heal Dimitri. They'd have to essentially get close enough to kill him. The Shadow Kissed don't have the gift of life, only the spirit blessed, he explained. The question is, who is capable of doing it? Gentle girl or drunken sod? His eyes flicked between Lissa and Adrian. My wager would be on gentle girl. After being told this, Rose realizes that when Victor made his daughter Natalie turn herself Strigoi, he was planning on turning her back. Like, he didn't callously sacrifice her to try and escape, but she did still die. And so Rose, and me to be honest, feel really bad for Victor for just a minute. And he does seem kind of upset when she brings up Natalie. Because he was using his daughter and things got out of control, but he did care about her. And he does very clearly regret that she died because of his actions. He's a bad person, but he's not a complete monster. You know, I, I wish they spent some more time developing Victor and making him into a, a bigger threat. But we get a few moments with him that make it clear, like, oh, okay, yeah, he, he has some depth to him. I, I do like that. But anyways, Victor agrees to show Lissa and Adrian how to make a special spirit stake, and they take him to their room so he can show them. As they're heading to the room, some Strigoi appear in the crowd, one of whom is Dimitri! Somehow he tracked Rose down to the, this spot, I don't know exactly how. But Eddie and Rose fight Dimitri while the others escape. And Rose has the chance to kill him, but she just can't bring herself to do it. So then human security, the, like the regular hotel security arrives, and they run, like the heroes, run while Dimitri kills a couple of people. Ah! What the fuck? 
like yeah rose had the chance to stop him before he did that and he kills several people that that's that's her fault just throwing that out there and when they get away eddie says basically the same thing dimitri left a pile of corpses there you know it people died because you wouldn't let me stake him i flinched realizing eddie was right it should have ended there i hadn't gotten a good look at the number of security guards how many had died it wasn't relevant only the fact that innocent people had died mattered even one was too many and it was my fault and yes it is but it after a couple of chapters, it seems like everyone just kind of forgets about it, and Rose never really has to grapple with the fact that people died because of her. Like, the last couple of books, Rose acts a lot shittier than she did in the first four. So she does tell Eddie that her and Dimitri had a relationship, and he tells her about the reason they're on this mission, because this whole time, Eddie didn't know exactly what they were up to, he just knew that they needed information that only Victor could get for them, and he's going along with it because, again, Rose is his friend and he feels like he owes her. However, Eddie doesn't believe Robert's story. He thinks that he's just crazy and he doesn't think that Strigoi can be healed. And, again, he is here to help his friends, but he also thinks that letting Strigoi run free is completely unacceptable. So he's really, really mad at Rose. Remember, he's traumatized by watching his best friend be murdered by a Strigoi. The two of them managed to find Lissa and Adrian, but Victor and Robert have run off. They, they escaped somewhere. So they go to a nearby casino that has a bunch of Maroi hanging out in it. It's like a popular spot for them. And they book a flight home. And while they're there waiting, Rose talks to a Maroi patron who mentions that Lissa's dad was a party animal and that he probably cheated on Lissa's mom a whole lot. Once again, her family, while she did love them, they weren't perfect, they, they were flawed. Adrian uses his powers to cheat at poker a little bit, and then they fly back to court. Eddie and Rose get chewed out because, you know, they're, they're like official guardians now, and they <clears throat> immediately ran off to party. Like, they, they tell everyone that they just ran off to Vegas for a little bit. They don't tell them about the, you know, prison break, obviously, and no one knows it was them, so they aren't in serious trouble, but they do get assigned to manual labor for a while. Eddie is also not talking to Rose right now, which is understandable. He's very upset with her. Like I said, she's a lot more selfish and unlikable in the last couple of books. It's like the author just took her initial flaws too far, but then she doesn't really make up for them with anything else. So Christian is at court as well, and he confronts them, and he asks, Hey, why did you break Victor out of prison? And Rose wants to lie about it, but Eddie just confirms everything. He's like, yeah, we, we broke him out of prison, and then tells them about how Rose is searching for a way to heal Strigoi. Rose says she doesn't want to let Lissa risk herself to kill a Strigoi. Like, she says she would rather let Dimitri die than do that because she thinks if Lissa actually got close enough to try and stake him through the heart, it would just get her killed. And then she snaps at her friends and says, Yes, I know. I screwed up. There was no purpose to any of this, and it's not going to go anywhere. But through the bond, she can see that Lissa and Christian are trying to practice a little bit more with physical combat so that maybe she can try and learn how to heal Strigoi. Because this would have implications beyond Dimitri. You know, it could possibly save a lot of people. But Rose is mad at them for taking that risk because only Rose is allowed to convince her friends to do something risky and stupid. After a little while, Adrian tells Rose that he forgives her for lying to him, but he also says, you need to let Dimitri go. Like, he really is gone. We're not going to be able to bring him back. She also informs Mikhail, the guy who helped her out, what happened. And it turns out that when he ran off to try and kill Miss Carp and then came back, uh, <clears throat> he was punished for that. That's why he works in administration. Like, he's still there years later. So Lissa and Christian, like I said, they practice fighting for a bit. Uh, they're at a hotel nearby. Lissa's doing a college visit to look at a university that she might attend later. And another guardian offers to coach them and just shows them how to do it a little better. Rose remarks that Lissa and Christian seem to be getting along better than they were earlier, and maybe they'll start dating again. Spoiler alert, they do. There's not a lot of fanfare. They just decide, okay, we were mad at each other, we were on a break, but now we're, we're together again. So Rose gets summoned by Queen Tatiana, and she's at a meeting of other royal families, and she asks Rose to testify about her time hunting and fighting Strigoi. And Tatiana seems happy with her testimony and then dismisses her. Rose realizes that Tatiana is trying to convince all of the others to take the fight to the Strigoi, like people have been trying to reform the society to do for this 
entire book series. She's also possibly trying to show that Rose is competent so they everyone can trust her being Lissa's guardian. So Tatiana is warming up to her because whatever else you want to say about Rose, she's very good at killing Strigoi. Now, as Lissa is leaving the hotel with uh, Christian and her guardians, some Strigoi attack, including Dimitri. Again, not sure how he tracked her down over here, but he, he did. Uh, and then he, the Strigoi kill the guardians and they take Lissa and Christian captive. He knows about the bond. He's doing this specifically to lure Rose out of hiding so that he can find her. Rose tells the other guardians about this and they prepare a rescue attempt. So a bunch of guardians gear up, get into some vans, and they go off to the warehouse, which is full of Strigoi, led by Dimitri. They break in and then the fight starts. It's a tight space, like a really crowded melee, but Rose is still able to just stand in the middle of this and talk to Dimitri for a minute. Like, I don't know, I'm just kind of imagining her standing in the middle of a mosh pit trying to monologue and then getting bowled over by someone. Like, that's, that's a thing that happened to me once. Like, I wasn't monologuing, but I stood too close to the edge of a pit and a guy thought I was in it and just crashed directly into me. It's not fun. Meanwhile, Lissa and Christian actually managed to free themselves. And Rose and Dimitri fight for a minute, and it's dumb. Dimitri laughed at my dodge. I'd be impressed if that wasn't something a ten-year-old could do. Now you're friends. Well, they're also fighting at a ten-year-old level. And for Moroi, that's actually pretty good. Yeah, well, we'll see what your assessment is when I kill you, I told him. I made a small feint to test how he was paying attention. He sidestepped with hardly any notice at all, as graceful as a dancer. You can't, Rose. Haven't you figured that out by now? Haven't you seen it? You can't defeat me. You can't kill me. Even if you could, you can't bring yourself to do it. You'll hesitate. Again. Okay, that's how people talk in kung fu movies. That's not a thing you can really do while you're fighting, guys. But anyways, they fight for a bit, and then Lissa and Christian come and they push Rose out of the way. Because it turns out Lissa managed to charm a stake, and somehow kept Rose from seeing it via the bond. Sure, she can do that now. And Christian sets Dimitri on fire as a distraction, and Lissa just barely manages to stake him in the heart. Rose tries to intervene, but Lissa uses compulsion to make her back off. And then there's a huge flash of magic, and Dimitri is healed. He, he's a dampier again. Like, uh, Lissa is, like, very tired out by it, like, almost passes out from the strain, but Dimitri is healed. He's, he's a dampier. He's no longer Strigoi. And everyone watching is shocked, and then the Guardians manage to kill the remaining Strigoi, and then they drag off Rose and the others. Dimitri is taken away separately. Back at court, Rose tries to demand being led into the dungeon to see him, but the guards all say no largely because Dimitri has specifically been asking not to see Rose, so she can't visit him. Lissa, however, is allowed to visit him, and Rose is able to watch their meeting through the bond. Dimitri is grateful, he says that she saved his life and he pledges his undying loyalty to her, but he's ashamed of what he did to Rose while he was a Strigoi and he can't bear to see her. The royals throw a big fancy party called the Death Watch, it's basically a funeral for the people who died in battle, but also only the royals can come, you know, none of the guardians or anyone else who lost anyone or who were there get to go, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, and it goes pretty well, but Adrian actually snuck Rose in. She's not supposed to be there. Again, she was at the battle. She wants to see her comrade's funeral, but she's not allowed. Adrian sneaks her in. Tatiana notices she's there, and she isn't upset, but she says, hey, Rose, you're not supposed to be here, and makes her leave. Mikhail conveniently manages to get her into the dungeon so that she can go and see Dimitri. And Dimitri tells her that they can't be together anymore and she should be happy with Adrian. Which is sound advice, but you know she's not going to follow it. Meanwhile, the Royal Council has made a decree that Dampier will become guardians at age 16 instead of 18. Because apparently Rose's testimony was good enough to convince everyone that, yeah, 16's old enough for them to go off into battle in life and death situations, sure. And Rose tells them all off, and they're mad that this young Dampier is getting uppity with them. Uh, and she tries to say that Lyssa needs to vote on behalf of the Dragomir family, because th it was actually a very close vote. If there had been one more in the opposite direction, it would have failed, uh, and Lyssa wasn't invited to the bo vote. However, the reason she wasn't invited to the vote, because normally each of the twelve royal families gets one, uh, but Lyssa's the only Dragomir left, and apparently a family has to have at least two members to have a vote on the council. So Rose calls Tatiana a bitch and then she gets removed, 
But as soon as she's outside the room, one of the guardians tells her she was fantastic in there and he agrees with her. Adrian's mother says that Adrian is going to a cocktail party and Rose agrees to go with him. And then later she goes to see the Roma psychic again and she gets some vague predictions about going on a journey soon. L look, either have prophecies in your book or don't. You know, don't give us this half-assed nonsense. It's just a waste of time. So there's a crowd gathered outside along with Dimitri. Like, he's just standing out in the sunlight, so he's proving to everyone he's not a Strigoi anymore. And he can touch a silver stake without being burned by it. Like, he, he gets cut by it the way, you know, normal people would, but he doesn't get burned the way a Strigoi would. And he, his cut that he gets doesn't heal right away. So, again, everyone's seeing, like, okay, yes, that this guy is no longer a Strigoi. We really can heal people now. And Rose asks him to tell everyone where the other Strigoi hide hideouts are that he knows about so that they can attack them, and then he does. Afterwards, Rose sees a man standing nearby watching her, so she goes over and asks who he is. He says that he works for her father and then gives her with a bag with a laptop and some pieces of paper. Uh, it's a note from Abe saying that uh, she should set it up to have a meeting at 7 a.m. the next morning. So she does, and who's on the other end of the video call? It's Sydney! Uh, which video, this book came out in like 2010, video calls were a lot less common back then, so it was you know, more impressive than it would be today. Uh, but it turns out Sydney was reassigned to New Orleans, and Abe actually helped her get reassigned, she hated being in Russia, uh, but now she owes him. And she asked Rose if she broke into anywhere lately. But she's not referring to Tar Tarasov prison, uh, somebody broke into an alchemist building somewhere, and stole some files from them. The files were on Eric Dragomir, who is Lissa's father. Apparently he set up a bank account in Las Vegas and put a bunch of money into it. Uh, it belongs to a woman named Jane Doe, which is obviously a pseudonym, that's not her real name, uh, and Sydney won't say any more about it, she just wanted to know that Rose was uninvolved, which she was, and so she said, okay cool, nothing more to talk about. So Rose goes outside and sees Adrian, and then suddenly remembers that she was supposed to go to a party with him. Like, he waited for, like, an hour before giving up. And he goes in on her, saying she's not really invested in their relationship, and that she's just using him. Which is accurate. That's what she's doing here. That, that's what she's been doing for a while. Later, she sees Dimitri is in a church. Again, Strigoi can't enter churches, so it's, it's clear he's been healed. And Rose tries to get him to forgive himself. And he says he doesn't love her anymore, and she runs out. But then she goes to Adrian and mentions the stuff about the secret bank account, and he says that Lissa's father was probably sending money to a mistress, which I, I don't think we needed someone to spell that out for us, but yeah, that's probably what she was doing. And he also, he forgives her now. He understands that she had a lot on her plate or something. I don't know, she's the protagonist. People forgive her for things. So they nearly have sex, but they don't have any protection, so they decide not to. Rose spends an entire page explaining that having a baby is difficult. Again, I don't think you need to spell that out, but I guess this is aimed at teenagers, so sure, why not? Throw, throw that in there. Bring the teenage pregnancy rates down, that's a good thing. She does let him drink some of her blood, though. And the next morning, she goes to Dimitri again and tells him about the new law lowering the age for guardians, and they both think it's stupid. Like, even with... Uh, training up until they're 18, a lot of Guardians get killed as soon as Strigoi come into the picture, and with less training, more kids are going to get killed. So then the Queen's guards appear, and they arrest Rose for the murder of Queen Tatiana. Yeah, turns out she has been killed. She's gone. Rose is brought to a cell, and she's kept there for a while. Uh, meanwhile, Christian and Lissa, li like I said, they, they get back together. They, I guess they're, it's just official now that they're dating again. Uh, but Rose was with Adrian at the time of the murder, so she has an alibi. Right? Well, apparently not. There's a preliminary hearing before the trial actually starts, and Abe agrees to be her lawyer. She dismisses her other lawyer, even though Adrian had to jump through a couple of hoops to get this, like, super nice, high-priced lawyer for her. But whatever. We've already established that she does not appreciate anything Adrian does for her. And then a witness says that Adrian didn't come to Rose's room until after the time of death. So, in other words, Adrian being with Rose, it was after the time of the murder, so it doesn't actually work as an alibi. And Tatiana was killed with Rose's silver stake, and Rose confirms in front of the court that, yeah, that, that's mine. So it moves to trial. Rose tries to defend herself in front of all these people by saying, this is all too suspicious. 
and I'm a smart criminal who wouldn't get caught. That's stupid! Use your common sense! This doesn't work, obviously. And as she's leaving, Ambrose passes her a note, which was from Tatiana, written right before she died. And the note says that Lissa's father had an illegitimate child, meaning Lissa is not the last Dragomir. But <clears throat> Tatiana doesn't know who or where this bastard child is. So as Rose gets dragged off to her cell, Abe tells her that if she's convicted, she's not going to prison, she's going to be executed. And that's the end of book five. Now we reach book six, the finale called Last Sacrifice. So Rose is in her cell, she reiterates everything that happened to the audience, and then Abe comes to talk to her. She's been in here for a couple of weeks at this stage. He tells her that she shouldn't have gone on about how, if I was the murderer, I would have done it better, because it turns out going full O.J. Simpson in a courtroom does not make you look innocent. The trial is also being moved up, it's happening in two weeks, and Abe gives her a copy of The Count of Monte Cristo and says, he won't let her be executed. And for once, this book series does know how to use foreshadowing properly. Well, I don't know if they use it properly, but like there's some foreshadowing happening here. Uh, so Rose summons the ghosts when he leaves, which is weird because they're inside wards. I thought ghosts couldn't show up there, but whatever. In this one scene, she's able to summon the ghost of Queen Tatiana. And she asks her if she wrote the note, and the ghost does confirm that she wrote the note. So Queen Tatiana really did write that. It's not some sort of forgery. Lissa and some of the others are preparing for the Queen's funeral, and they don't know about the illegitimate sibling because Rose didn't think that was important to share. <laughs> like, come on, Rose. You, you should tell somebody about that. At the very least, Lissa might have a brother or sister she doesn't know about. That's something she, she has the right to know about. But whatever. Uh, while Lissa and some others are carrying Tatiana's body, some nearby statues explode, and everyone panics, but not Lissa. So then Eddie and Mikhail come down to Rose's cell, and they let her out, and Dimitri and Adrian are there too. Like, this whole thing was to free her, like the statues exploding was just a distraction. They use some compulsion to make sure the guards only remember Dimitri, so that way they'll assume that he helped Rose alone, and Rose knows that if she runs and doesn't allow things to go to trial, she'll be hunted and killed on sight, but decides to do it anyways. So they all run out, and on their way to the getaway car, she fights an old classmate on the way out and feels kind of bad about it. By the getaway car is Abe. Turns out he orchestrated this whole thing. He, he got them the explosives. So the only Muslim character in this book series orchestrated a fucking terrorist attack. No comment. But Abe is going to use his connections to investigate and see if he can find the real killer and clear Rose's name while she's on the run. He just doesn't think that two weeks is enough time to do that. But the thing is, Rose, even if she didn't murder the queen, her escaping from the cell and fighting people, this involves a lot of other crimes. So I feel like she should probably go to prison anyways after she comes back. That's not going to happen, but you know, I, I feel like that should happen. So her and Dimitri get in the car and drive off. Everyone else like goes back to normal and acts like they didn't know anything was happening. Uh, someone follows Rose and Dimitri, but they manage to lose the tail in Harrisburg, which is a nearby city in Pennsylvania. Rose is able to buy a hat to disguise herself because she still has some cash on her. Like she just had that on her when she was arrested and they just let her keep it. I sure. Because they were seen in going in that getaway car, Dimitri gets them a new car. Did you hotwire this car? I then rephrased my question. Did you steal this car? You have an interesting set of morals, he observed. Breaking out of jail is okay, but steal a car and you sound totally outraged. Yes, yes, Dimitri. There, there's a difference between breaking out of prison, especially if you're innocent, and stealing someone's property that they probably rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, just getting to and from work, if nothing else. Like, the, the, there is a difference between those two things. So they drive somewhere else for several hours, and they meet Sydney in a parking lot. She has yet another new car for them, so they abandon the old one that they stole, and she says that they're going to West Virginia. And Rose doesn't want to go to West Virginia. Understandable, no one should ever go there. But you're a fugitive, get over yourself, girl. So they drive to the middle of nowhere in West Virginia, and they check into a motel. Meanwhile, Lissa and company are interrogated, but they all have solid alibis. Like, they had their stories sorted out beforehand. And Rose, th th the plan here is for Rose to lie low and do nothing while the others prove her innocence. 
She is upset about the thought of staying out of the way. And she's like, I gotta do something. Once again, she's a fugitive, but whatever. Dimitri is sworn to serve Lyssa because she saved his life, and Lyssa told them to stay, so he's like, yeah, no, we're staying, no matter what you say, Rose. Rose doesn't even have, like, anything she wants to do. She's just like, no, we gotta go off and d d do something. And Rose is kind of annoyed that he swore allegiance to Lyssa and not her because she also helped bring him back to life. And she tries to fight him for a minute because she wants to, some again, run off somewhere and just magically find the killer of Tatiana somehow. She has no plan. It doesn't work at first because Dimitri's much better at fighting than her. But she manages to kiss him, and then that distracts him, so she incapacitates him, and then she runs out of the hotel room and just runs off into the woods. And while she's running past the front desk, she just screams at the desk clerk that a man is after her. And then she runs off into the fucking woods in the middle of the night. You, you idiot. You're honestly an idiot. I don't, know what's, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like, she literally couldn't take an hour to formulate a plan. Just, just, this is her plan. Just run off into the fucking woods. <laughs> Remember how I said Rose becomes a lot more unlikable in the last two books? Yeah, uh, that, this is a good example of that. So Lyssa gets interrogated some more, and she claims that she's innocent, but she does reveal to the interrogators that, uh, Rose and Dimitri are romantically involved. And everyone else is appropriately upset about that. They don't think Dimitri is a Strigoi, though. It's, it's pretty clear to them that, like, okay, yeah, he... He's not a Strigoi, he's just in love with this girl, so that's why he helped her escape. And Lyssa discusses the whole situation with Abe. They think back to Ambrose giving Rose the note and think like, oh, okay, yeah, he, he gave her that note, we should investigate that. Again, Rose was in a cell for several weeks and Abe apparently never thought to ask her about that. But yeah, they're like, okay, let's investigate the note. So while Rose is just running through the fucking woods in the middle of the night, Dimitri catches her and she thinks about finding Lissa's sibling, which maybe she should have done earlier. Like, maybe back at the hotel room she could have gone, Hey, Sydney and Dimitri, let's call up my dad who helped us hide and has tons of connections and see what he might know about this. Or maybe we could spend some time looking for leads ourselves, and if we don't have any luck by searching while we're just in this hotel room, then I can run off into the woods. <laughs> Nah, just run into the trees, that'll help. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to harp on this forever, but it's just so dumb. And it's not dumb in an in-character way where I understand and empathize with her actions. It's just dumb. So Rose and Dimitri head back to the hotel, but police are there! Because, yeah, it turns out that when you run past a desk clerk screaming for help and saying a man is after you, they're probably going to call the authorities. <laughs> This book definitely needed to be 600 pages long. None of this conflict is contrived at all. But anyway, Sydney realized when the cops were coming that she needed to skedaddle, so she drove off somewhere, she's nearby with the car, they find her, and then they take off. And now they don't have a hideout, so they have to going to find to have eh, they're going to have a more difficult time finding the mystery Dragomir bastard. So Adrian and Lissa find out that the desk receptionist who testified at the hearing that he saw Adrian come in, but not until after the murder, uh, they find out he was paid off to make sure that Adrian had an alibi during the murder. And who paid him? A regular Maroi that no one seems to know the name of. Meanwhile, Rose and company are deep in the mountains, and they run into some people called the Keepers. Now, the Keepers are a weird parallel society, which they don't spend much time or any time really going into them, they are Moroi, Dampier, and humans that all just live together. And they, quote, keep to the old ways. Basically, they stay away from human society, and Rose has just never heard of them. They also seem to view the Moroi monarchs as usurpers for whatever reason. They think that you shouldn't have an election to determine the queen. They think that you should have a fight to the death to determine, determine who will be the next monarch. Which sounds kind of interesting, but again, they don't really go into any detail. Their leader is a guy named Raymond, and he agrees to give them refuge because he thinks that Rose killed Tatiana. Like, he hated Tatiana, and her killers are A-OK -okay in his book. Rose doesn't mention that she's not the one that killed the queen, but, you know, he, he thinks that. And Raymond is also a Moroi who is married to a human woman, and Rose is, like, shocked by this. <clears throat> she also says that all these people around her talking, that she's saying they speak with southern accents, which is not how people talk in West Virginia. Like, a southern accent sounds like this. So this is the, see what I sound like with an accent, without an accent. 
I start with accent first? Yeah. Like just talking normal. Just right? talking normal. Just the really dog licked the oil and everyone laughed. In West Virginia, they'd probably be talking with an Appalachian accent, which sounds more like this. Well, the way people talk around here, I guess it'd be what more like you call hillbilly style or something, I guess. I don't know, just mountain talk. Anyways, while Rose is sleeping, Robert and Victor pull her into a spirit dream so the three of them can talk. She immediately tries to attack them, but, you know, it doesn't work. And her and Victor talk for a minute, and they deduce that whoever killed Tatiana probably wants to enact an even harsher law towards the Dampier. Basically, just conscript them all and give them zero choice about whether or not they're going to become guardians and watch over the Moroi and protect them from Strigoi. And <clears throat> Lissa, or not Lissa, Rose reveals that there is another Dragomir, Lissa's bastard half-sibling, uh, because she thinks that Victor would have already known about that, but apparently he didn't. He is also shocked by this. But they figure that whoever killed Tatiana is also trying to cover up Lissa's sibling. Because if her sibling is revealed, then that means Lissa will have more power among the royals, so Rose and Victor agree to temporarily work together. The others decide to nominate Lissa for queen, because remember they're having an election where the royals will vote on things, and she can run, but no one can actually vote for her because of, like, weird laws. Doesn't need to be explained that much. But while she's running for queen, she can... Actually, this doesn't tie into anything. Like, it doesn't tie into the search for her sister. It doesn't tie into trying to prove Rose's innocence. It, it's just Lissa is running for queen now. I've connected the two dots. You didn't connect shit, but... I've connected them. Adrian visits Rose's dreams too, and nothing important happens. But I also realized that by this point, people know about Adrian's spirit powers. People know about Lissa's spirit powers. They, they should know that Adrian can visit people in dreams. But none of them ever ask him, hey, you should go find your ex-girlfriend. You should visit her dreams and find out where she is. No one seems to ask him about that or tell him to do it. So Sydney goes somewhere to get internet access and searches records for a while before she learns that the bank account that Lissa's uh, dad's mistress was had, it was under the name Jane Doe. But there was a next of kin listed, Sonia Karp, the same teacher that went crazy and turned herself Strigoi and then went on the run somewhere many years ago. Now, Carp is too young to be the mistress. She's just a relative of the mistress, at least probably. That's probably what happened. But Dimitri calls an old Strigoi friend and tells him to find Carp because the other Strigoi don't know he's been turned back to normal yet. That's apparently outside of... They haven't found out yet. Uh, one of the keepers proposes to Rose, asks her to marry him, but she says no. Then a different one fights her, and Rose wins, and apparently that was part of the engagement ceremony. But Rose still refuses to marry this guy, and everyone seems to drop the subject, and then they leave, and the keepers never come back up. That's the last we see of them. Now, Dimitri hears back from his Strigoi friend, and they tell him that they know somebody who knows where Carp is. That person is in Lexington, Kentucky. Also, Carp is important enough to get her own picture now. It's, it's that. Uh, the books usually call her Sonia by her first name, but I think Carp is funnier, so that's, that's what I'm going to be calling her. So, Sydney, Rose, and Dimitri pile into the car, and they drive off to Lexington, Kentucky. On the drive over, Rose enters Lissa's mind, and Lissa talks to Ambrose, who says that Tatiana did have another lover beside him, but uh, the other lover probably didn't kill her. And then Lissa and several other royals are nominated for being a new queen. People object to Lissa, but there's no law against it, so they just, they let it go. <clears throat> so then Rose and the others arrive in Lexington. There are Strigoi there that run a tattoo parlor. Apparently, they, for the most part, people just get regular tattoos there, but the more vulnerable customers get eaten. So they send Sydney in uh, with her alchemist tattoo covered up. She pretends to be Dimitri's servant, and then she lures out the Strigoi they're looking for, whose name is Donovan. And then Rose and Dimitri ambush him. Dimitri nearly kills the guy in Bloodlust, but Rose prevents that. So they smack Donovan around for a minute until he says that Carp is hiding out in Paris. Not the Paris you're thinking of. There's a, a different town called Paris in Kentucky. Not far away from Lexington, actually. Kind of convenient. They don't have to drive that far. Specifically, he says that she's in a blue house by a lake. And then Dimitri kills Donovan and loses control because he's trying to make up for what he did while he was a Strigoi. Rose has to reassure him that he's a good person and he's not a Strigoi anymore. And then later she actually praises Sydney for being 
willing to go into danger, like walk into a den of Strigoi without any sort of protection, which, yeah, that is kind of ballsy of her. So while she's sleeping, Victor and Robert visit again, and Rose tells him everything, including where they're going, which is a dumb idea, but she does at least hesitate. And then Adrian also visits her in her dream, and he mentions that without Rose there, Lissa's spirit-induced mental problems are getting worse, and he's also kind of worried about himself and what the future will bring. Adrian gazed off. Sometimes, sometimes I can believe the insanity is all imagined, you know? I've never felt it like the others, like Lissa or old Vlad. But once in a while, he paused. I don't know, I feel so close, Rose, so close to the edge. Like if I allow myself one small misstep, I'll plunge away and never come back. It's like I'll lose myself. And this seems like it's going somewhere interesting, but then Rose wakes up before it can go any deeper. So, cool. So when she wakes up, Rose tells the others about Victor and Robert and how she told them everything, and they're kind of annoyed with her because she didn't, that they didn't know that she helped them or that she gave them information. But anyways, they find Carp's house pretty quickly. Like, it's blue, it's in the correct spot, it has blackout curtains to keep out the sunlight, and it has flowers around it, which Carp used to grow flowers like that around the time that Rose knew her. So they smash the windows, letting in sunlight, and then they attack, and after a brief battle, they manage to chain her to a chair. So she doesn't answer any questions about the secret Dragomir bastard, though. Meanwhile, Lyssa, apparently in order to run for Monarch, you have to undergo a bunch of tests. Like, that, that, that's a thing. Before the election, all the candidates have to pass a series of them, because, you know, sure. Basically, they put Lyssa and some of the others in a forest during daytime, and they have to find their way out, because this book wasn't long enough, I guess? Like, I don't know. Look, this is an election. Adding weird tests to be more like the Hunger Games is fucking asinine, but it was 2010 and everyone was trying to be more like the fucking Hunger Games back then. Actually, everyone is still trying to be like the fucking Hunger Games. Lissa spends a couple of pages wandering in the woods and then she, she's fine. There, there's no issues. And then Victor and Robert show up at Carp's house and see the others. And Carp tries to escape, but while she's escaping, Robert grabs a stake and then he heals her. Like, again, there's a big burst of spirit energy, and Robert is, like, really taken out of it for a bit. He needs time to recover. But he does heal her. She, she's no longer a Strigoi. I'm not sure why they didn't think to offer that to her earlier and say, like, hey, if you cooperate, we'll turn you back to being your normal self. But they, they just didn't. Like I said, Lyssa passes her test in the forest without issue and then goes back to court. And she tells Christian that she really doesn't want to be queen, but she wants to take the test seriously because to not do so would be disrespectful. You know, it's part of Moroi culture. So Adrian brings her over to a guy named Blake Lazar, who was one of Tatiana's other lovers, right? So uh, he says that Ambrose is actually having an affair with Adrian's mom currently. He also names some other woman that he was sleeping with, who maybe she was jealous of the queen and maybe she's the one that killed Tatiana. And Lissa and Christian think that Adrian's mom might have been the one to kill the queen, but they don't say anything to him. Meanwhile, Rose and company try to get Carp to tell <coughs> them where the bastard Dragomir child is, and she refuses for a minute, but then just as it seems like they're making progress, Robert tries to compel her. I mean, he, he does it at, on the orders of his brother, but he tries to use compulsion on her. Carp realizes that he's trying to compel her and gets really mad, so using her spirit powers, she makes her plants grow and entangle people, because spirit users can do that now. And Robert fights back using telekinesis, because spirit users can do that now. The others manage to pull them apart, and Dimitri blames Rose for that fight starting, which is... Of all the things to blame her for, he blames her for that? I'm not sure, because for once it's not her fault. But anyways, Rose tells Carp that uh, she promised not to tell anyone about the mistress and the baby, but she didn't tell, uh, she didn't promise not to bring anyone to them. She agrees to do that. She'll just say, okay, I'll just lead you to the mistress and the baby, which I'm not sure of the logic there, but sure, whatever. So they all pile into a car and they take off. And then Lissa goes to take another test where an old woman has her drink from a magic cup and then she hallucinates her worst fears like Rose dying. And I don't give a shit because it's not real. Like, why? I don't know why writers think showing us something that's explicitly fake will get us invested. You know, showing us nightmare sequences, stuff we know is hallucinations. Like, just, just stop putting those in your book. We know they're not real. It's hard to care. But anyway, she passes her test. 
<coughs> and then she moves on from there. So Rose sees Adrian in yet another dream and accidentally reveals that they left the safe house because they haven't told anyone about this. They haven't told anyone where they are or what they're doing. And she mentions that they found Carp and healed her. She doesn't say much else. So they all drive to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they knock at a house, and it turns out that's where Jill lives. The young girl that they were training at school who kind of sort of had a crush on Christian and who Adrian kept calling Jailbait. You remember her? Because I, I didn't remember. I literally had to Google her to remember, to jog my memory. Anyways, Jill lives there with her mother, who is Carp's cousin, and her stepfather, because it turns out Jill is the secret Dragomir. Her dad was also Lissa's dad. The twist would hit a little bit harder if Jill was, you know, anything before this point. Like, she's barely even a character. But they tell everyone about how Eric Dragomir was her father. And she didn't know that. Her stepfather didn't know that. Her mother throws a dramatic fit about this information coming out. And I'm not sure why, because... Yes, I understand. This is a touchy subject. I get that. You had a bastard royal child with a man who wasn't really interested in being in a relationship with you, and then he died horribly. But, like, she's literally crying and threatening to call the police. But it turns out all of the money Eric sent, which was apparently a lot, is just being set aside for Jill when she's older. And I'm not sure how her mom was planning on explaining where the money came from without revealing who her dad is, because apparently she'd been telling Jill that her dad was just some bum who ran out on them. Like, was she gonna say, yeah, he was just a bum who ran out on us, but he also left you enough money to buy a house. Like, again, she didn't think this through. But Jill's mom doesn't want her to go to court because she thinks it's dangerous. But sooner or later, their secret's gonna get out. So Jill, her mom, and her stepfather all agree to just go over to court and help Lissa out with, you know, all the stuff that she's doing. And then they all stop and eat dinner. They, they put an illusion on Victor and Robert so that they aren't recognized because remember, they're fugitives. They're all fugitives, but whatever. Those two specifically are considered a lot more dangerous, so they put an illusion on them. Meanwhile, Lissa and company go to talk to Ambrose some more. Turns out he actually stole documents from Queen Tatiana's belongings, and there's a letter. It's unsigned, but whoever wrote it was clearly really mad. It says that Tatiana was stupid, and all Dampier needed to be forced to be guardians. And then right after that, a Moroi man tries to kill Lyssa, but Eddie stops this guy and kills him while defending her. And some other guardians come in and violently arrest Eddie, but then the vision cuts off there. And then Rose and Dimitri have an intimate moment. They almost kiss, but they're interrupted by guardians raiding the house. It seems like somebody called them. Pro I don't think it's ever actually confirmed, but it probably Jill's mom called them and brought them over. So Sydney distracts them while Rose and Dimitri run. They jump out a window while they're being shot at. They run into a neighbor's house. The neighbors aren't home, so they steal their car and drive off. <laughs> Once again, what did these people do to you? <laughs> they think the others were most likely arrested, and they realize, okay, yeah, Jill's parents probably called them, called the guardians. And Rose decides to tell Adrian about Jill being Lissa's sister, because like now that they found her, they're like, okay, yeah, we should probably tell the others about this secret. So her and Dimitri sleep in a tent in the woods, and then Carp visits her in a dream. And it turns out Carp managed to escape, but Victor and Robert took Jill somewhere. So they agree to meet up for their next move. Carp also mentions, because obviously we're gonna get some weird soulmates bullshit, she mentions that Rose's aura is different with Adrian than when she's with Dimitri. Because she's clearly in love with Dimitri, because they're soulmates and they complete each other, it's like, the, it's like the actual excuse used by the books. This isn't subtext, this is just text. I just want to take a moment to point out that this woman used to be a teacher and now she's very explicitly encouraging a relationship between a teacher and one of his students. Just, just, just throwing that out there. Okay, technically she is his former student, but they did have sex while she was still his student and while she was underage. So, you know, just throwing that out there. Well, you've got to figure it out. I don't believe in soulmates, not exactly. I think it's ridiculous to think that there's only one person out there for us. What if your soulmate lives in Zimbabwe? What if he dies young? I also think two souls becoming one is ridiculous. You need to hold on to yourself. But I do believe in souls being in sync, souls that mirror each other. I see that synchronicity in auras. I can see love too. And I see all of that in his aura and in yours. Only you can choose what to do with that information if you even believe it. Dimitri also helps Carp 
work through the guilt of what she did while she was a Strigoi. So like half the conversation here is good. I'll, I'll give it that. Anyways, Lissa and Eddie are being interrogated about the man that they killed in self-defense. This guy has a scarred hand, which Lissa remembers pretty clearly. Uh, because the receptionist who testified about Adrian being with Rose right after the murder mentioned someone like that, mentioned someone with a scar on his hand, so they realize, okay, this was the guy who bribed him, but who was he working for? And they tell her about Rose kidnapping Jill and how Sydney is the only one that they arrested. So they bring Sydney in along with some other alchemists, and she admits to helping Rose and Dimitri get to Ann Arbor, but she doesn't reveal anything else. The alchemists have a fight with the Guardians about not leaving Sydney in their custody, and they agree to stay in a nearby hotel outside of court until the investigation is done. One of the alchemists is a guy named Ian, and see he seems to know the man that Eddie killed, but they don't go into detail on that quite yet. After this, Lissa goes to the final test, which is the old woman from before asking her a riddle. She asks her, what does a queen need to truly rule? And she gets a day to think it over. But that's not important because Rose wakes up and she's snuggling with Dimitri, and he wakes up and is uncomfortable about it, and he, he still feels bad about being attracted to her, but she thinks it's fine because now she's 18. For no particular reason, here's the definition of child grooming. And then Carp finally arrives and they meet up. Turns out she spoke to Jill via her dream, and she knows that she's somewhere in western Michigan. They aren't that far away right now. So they drive to where she is with Victor. But let's stop to discuss Victor, er, <coughs> to discuss Dimitri and Rose yet again. Rose, I've done a lot of bad things, most of which I can never fix or find redemption for. My only choice now, if I want to reclaim my life, is to go forward, stopping evil and doing what's right. And what is not right is taking a woman from another man, a man I like and respect, I'll steal cars, I'll break into houses, but there are lines I will not cross, no matter what I... And then he gets cut off, but like, that... That's what he's concerned about, not the... everything else. Hey, did you know the author of these books, Rochelle Mead, also used to be a teacher? Anyways, Victor and Robert come out with Jill in tow, and Rose and Dimitri ambush them. There's a brief fight, Victor uses magic to make an earthquake happen to try and defeat Rose, uh, and then she throws him against a wall and breaks his neck. Yeah, he is killed rather unceremoniously, actually. And Robert is about to try and resurrect him, so they drag him away. And they, apparently Dimitri just knocks him out and then leaves him nearby in, in some bushes. And then they dispose of Victor's body, and that's the last we see of them. We never see Robert again after that. Rose feels kind of bad for killing Victor which uh, the other people blame it on the spirit backlash, like, oh yeah, the darkness overtook you for a second, but you don't even need that. Like, it was a case of self-defense, and like, she can feel bad for killing a person, but it was pretty clearly the right thing to do. I don't know. It, it, Rose and Dimitri both feel bad because they killed innocents, and then they learn to move on. Then they admit that they're in love and they have sex. Once again, I choose to hope that they use a condom. Dimitri feels guilty for stealing Adrian's woman, but he doesn't feel guilty for anything else. And Rose resolves, like, okay, d don't tell Adrian about this, I'm gonna break up with him as soon as I get a chance. Because remember, the two of them are kinda dating still, and she's just having sex with Dimitri right now. So Lissa is still investigating Tatiana's death. No nothing else is occurring. Rose tells Adrian, via dreams, to have Mikhail meet her at a restaurant outside of court. She doesn't mention Jill's parentage for some reason. Uh, Lissa learns that Tatiana was having some high-ranking Moroi trained to defend themselves, including Adrian's mom. And also the old woman administering the tests is the previous queen. It's not actually important to anything, but I thought uh, to mention it. And L Lissa goes back to her and tells her the answer to the riddle. To properly rule, a queen must have nothing. She must give everything to her people, and also live in a fucking palace surrounded by servants that wait on her hand and foot. But, you know, other than that, she gives up everything. So Lissa, along with a couple other candidates, manages to move on to the final vote. So Rose asks Carp to make a charm that, to disguise her appearance because they're going to go find the alchemists to find proof that Adrian's mom killed the queen. Because Lissa also believes that Adrian's mom killed the queen. And because the most likely winner of the election is someone that Adrian's mom has a lot of influence over. It seems like it was 
all a political operation. And Lisa, Lisa mentions just kind of in passing that everyone should get a vote when choosing a new monarch, not just the royals. Uh, their candidates, there's only three left, they all make a final speech before the big vote happens. Uh, in Lissa's speech, she promises reforms. Uh, she wants to give non-royals and Dampier a voice, but because she has no family, she can't actually proceed to the final vote. The crowd, however, goes nuts, and they're demanding, like, hey, we, we need to make Lissa queen, or at least allow her to be voted on, and a borderline riot breaks out. And it, but that's not important. We go back to Rose now. They arrive at the restaurant, and they meet Mikhail there. And he's amazed and happy to see Carp, and so he agrees to help them do whatever they need to do. And so he helps Rose get into the hotel where the alchemists are staying. Because, like I said, Carp made a charm which changes their appearances. So Rose and Mikhail go there pretending to be guardians, and they relieve the other guardians from their duty. And then they go in to talk to Sidney and the other alchemist, Ian. Ian admits that he knew the Moroi guy that Eddie killed earlier, says that he was a bodyguard for a woman who visited an alchemist facility a while ago. He doesn't know the woman's name, but he describes her, and it's someone that Rose recognizes, and it's not Adrian's mom, but she doesn't say right away who it is. So they get to court without issue, they meet up with Abe, and he gets everybody gathered for the, you know, the, gathered for the election, he just gets them all together and gets their attention. And Rose, in disguise, brings up Jill and says, hey, she is also a Dragomir. Lissa can have people vote for her and run for queen. And then Adrian's mom comes forward and backs her up. It turns out she was the one who broke into the alchemist uh, storage facility and destroyed the records because she was trying to prevent Lissa from having power and influence. And Rose asks her, like, hey, why are, if you did this, why are you just admitting that you did it now? And she just says, well, the jig is up, you know? Like, you've brought Jill here. A simple DNA test will prove who she is. So Rose reveals who she is, like she takes the charm off and says, oh yeah, I'm Rose, I'm the person who's wanted for killing the last queen. And then she's surrounded by guardians, but Lyssa convinces them to let Rose speak for a moment. And she says that the real killer of Tatiana was Tasha Ozera. Re remember Christian's aunt, who's a martial artist instructor and was also, like, like, she wanted to marry Dimitri a little bit? Like, yeah, she's the one who killed Tatiana. The Maroi with the messed up hand that they recognized was apparently her bodyguard. Like, she disagreed with the Dampier age law, and she was seen in the Queen's chambers, but they didn't record it for whatever reason. And she framed Rose partially because it was an easy thing to do, but also partially because of Dimitri. Like, she was jealous of him and, of her and Dimitri, and she wanted to marry Dimitri. Now, this isn't really enough evidence to convict her, but it is enough to take her into custody at least. But rather than go along with this and maybe try to defend herself in court, Tasha resists. She steals a gun from a guardian and then takes a member of the crowd hostage. That member of the crowd happens to be Mia, because we forgot about her for, for quite a while. And then Lissa goes in and tries to save her, and Tasha shoots a couple of times. But Rose puts herself in front of Lissa, and she gets shot. Like, she lives, obviously. There's a healer. There's two. Also, Ta Tasha dies during this. Like, she's gone now. But, but yeah, obviously, Lissa, or not Lissa, obviously Rose lives, uh, but she doesn't live with help of the magical healers that are nearby. She lives with without magical help. They just, like, bandage her up and, like, yep, yep, you're good. She's unconscious for a couple of days, and when she wakes up, Dimitri is there. He tells her that she is Lissa's guardian now, and he is Christian's guardian. And Lissa comes to talk with her privately, and th their bond is gone. Like, their psychic bond is gone. Because apparently, nearly dying and then healing naturally broke it. Also, Lissa was elected queen uh, in all the chaos and is annoyed by it. But she's, she's like, well, I'm gonna do my duty, duty anyways. Because, again, living in a palace isn't a fucking duty, but whatever. Uh, she's still processing, like, having a new sister, and without the bond, she's gonna need to handle her spirit darkness alone, possibly with medication again. And Rose finds Dimitri after this and tells him that uh, she's breaking up with him, and he's upset because she cheated on him, which, yes, sh she did do that. Uh, like, she cheated on him, she was always pining for Dimitri when they were together, and she used his money to help get Dimitri back without asking him, really. Uh, but she says they aren't right together, and he tells her off for screwing people over. 
Not just me, little damp here, he added quietly. There's been a lot of collateral damage along the way while you battled against the world. I was a victim, obviously, but what about Jill? What happens to her now that you've abandoned her to the royal wolves? And Eddie, have you thought about him? And where's your alchemist? Which, yes, Rose has been selfish and inconsiderate. A lot. He's correct, but she still thinks she's better than he is. Victim, I said slowly. That's the difference between you and me. Huh? He'd been watching me closely while I'd considered the fates of my friends and was caught off guard now. What are you talking about? You said you were a victim. That's why, that's why ultimately, you and I aren't matched for each other. In spite of everything that's happened, I've never thought of myself that way. Being a victim means you're powerless, that you won't take action. Always, always I've done something to fight for myself. For others. No matter what. Yeah, sure, whatever, Rose. It really doesn't matter how you see yourself, girl. You used him. Like, like, a lot. But after this, several people tell Rose about how great she is and how then she forgets that she's supposed to feel guilty. So Dimitri meets Rose's parents and they want to get to know him because like, oh, you're dating my daughter, that's great. You seem like a good guy, but I still want to get to know you. And Janine throws in a line about wanting to know what they were up to while Rose was still an underage student of his, but this is the end of the book, so we don't get anything else with that. <laughs> and then Lissa's coronation happens, she's the new queen. Rose muses about how without the bond, she's truly her own person, because she, throughout the whole series, has often just looked at herself as an extension of Lissa. And that is the end of Vampire Academy. Wait, hold on, they didn't actually give anything up, though. Well, why is the final book called Last Sacrifice? So... That was, uh, that was a lot. You know, six books, three that were of reasonable length, and then three that were far too long. Yet it didn't feel like it amounted to all that much. There are some plot threads that go throughout the whole series, like how Lissa's weird powers fit into the world, some stuff about the Strigoi attacks getting worse, Rose and Dimitri's relationship, but I wouldn't say that the books have a single overarching story. You know, there's no antagonist defeated at the end. It doesn't feel like they fixed the problems. It feels like they took steps to fix them, but that's it. So the ending winds up being pretty unsatisfying, not to mention the other stuff that gets brought up and then dropped with very little fanfare. Like, where's Robert? They just killed his brother and then left him. Uh, Dimitri gave them a list of Strigoi hideouts in the second to last book. They don't do anything about that. What happened with the moon you and how they were torturing other students? You know, the, the Strigoi working with humans seems like it'll be a big deal, but it's barely a footnote. And I know there's a spin-off series for this called Bloodlines. Maybe some of this is covered in that, but that doesn't make this one any better. The main emotional through line of the story isn't the relationship between Rose and Lissa, which in my opinion it should be. It is Rose and Dimitri's relationship. Look, I've gone on about this a bit already, but sometimes love is forbidden for a good reason. A teacher dating one of his students is wildly inappropriate. Like a 24-year-old dating someone that age is also inappropriate, but it's less inappropriate. Like that that's the realm of Twitch streamers and Discord mods. We don't need that in young adult paranormal romance as well. Now, I will admit that sometimes there's some gray area, but this is a subject where if you're in the gray area, something has already gone pretty horribly wrong. But it's okay because Rose and Dimitri complete each other. They're soulmates. Their auras match up. And just... Look, I keep seeing stuff that's aimed at more or less the same audience, that's aimed at teen girls, and it's written by women, and it goes out of its way to justify and excuse this kind of shit. And it's really getting on my nerves, because when me and my sister were kids, I think I was like 15, maybe 16 when uh, this was a thing, uh, Pretty Little Liars was a show that she liked. And I, I know barely anything about that show, but I do know that it has a hot teacher, a hot young male teacher dating an underage student, but it's okay because he's hot. And I remember my sister telling me about that, and I was saying, that's kind of creepy. And then my sister would just repeat the excuses that the show gave, and I was thinking, it's really weird that this show is giving excuses to this young teenage girl, and she's buying into them. Now, my sister's older now, and she knows better, but I do wonder how many others didn't get the chance to learn better. Because, holy fucking shit, 
please, for the love of God, stop putting statutory rape in your media that's aimed at teenagers. Just stop doing it. Weirdly enough, one of the only things I've seen that's aimed at more or less the same audience that features this and also admits that it's wrong is Riverdale. Like, that, that show has a lot of bad stuff in it, but the way it handles the student-teacher relationship in the first season is actually pretty good because it shows you that it's wrong, but you also more or less see it from Archie's perspective and Archie doesn't realize that it's wrong. So it, it, it's handled kind of well. There's also a book called The Cheerleaders by Kara Thomas, which handles this subject a lot better because, look, just I, I don't want to go on the, about this too much longer, but adults who go after kids that age are just creepy and pathetic. Moving on from that, uh, all of Book 4 Blood Promise is pointless because Rose goes on a long journey to kill Dimitri and then he's still alive at the end. You know, you really could just skip that book entirely and then go to the next book where they heal him. Or better yet, just let him die. Because the scene where Rose kills him is, as I said, the best in the series by a pretty huge margin. Like, she should have to learn uh, to move on and process her mental trauma from that event. You know, maybe after that she decides that this should never happen to anyone else, so she goes around trying to find the cure for being a Strigoi. Because having her kill Dimitri and then reveal that he's still alive and then going on to resurrect him, that's double dipping. You know, you can't have it both ways. You can't have the emotional catharsis twice. Abe just kind of shows up in Rose's life and she never has to deal with the fact that he ignored her for 18 years. Like she's fine with him showing up and being her dad and like she never tells him off and gets mad at him the way she got mad at her mom for a little while in the second book. The Keepers and the Alchemists just kind of show up to help the heroes for a bit and then fade away again. Like they never really explore who they are and what they're all about. They, they barely feel like they're a part of this world so it makes the setting wider instead of deeper. Like, there's a lot of stuff I have to complain about here. And yet, in spite of all the complaints I have, I don't think Vampire Academy is a bad book series. I, I, overall, I'd say it's okay. There's plenty here that kept my interest. Rose is frustrating sometimes. In the last two books, she's frustrating a lot of the time. But I will take that over a plank of wood that's just pushed around by the plot, especially because a lot of the times when Rose is, you know, being frustrating, being dumb, it's clearly deliberate on the part of the author, you know? I, I would rather have that <clears throat> than just a character who's boring and impossibly beautiful so all the boys fawn over her because that's something I've seen way too much, you know? <clears throat> Rose manages to strike a balance between being a badass Strigoi hunter and just being a helpless damsel because for the most part she can protect herself. She does screw up occasionally though, and so she needs help from others. It's, it's very easy for any sort of story to go too far in one direction or the other, but it, it strikes a balance here, you know? Most other young adult books of this time, and even today I think, uh, would have had Rose go off to Russia to find Dimitri in Blood Promise, and instead of meeting Sidney the Alchemist, she would have met some hot bad boy who also hunts Strigoi, and he would be some sort of love interest who did all of the fighting for her, and then maybe at the end she would land the killing blow on Dimitri. But, like, Vampire Academy doesn't do that. It's like, hey, what if we had our protagonist actually do shit? So that's just kind of nice to see, especially in this genre. And on top of that, she spends a lot of time training and practicing. So it's just, it's beyond refreshing to see a protagonist who can look after herself and she also isn't some chosen one with powers that no one else has, even if she does frustrate me sometimes. Dimitri is also not a bad character, because it would have been easy for him to just be the hot, older love interest, but he's not. You know, number one, him and Rose have actual chemistry, much as I hate to say it. And he's also his own person, you know? He's someone who grew up at the mercy of an abusive father, and now he's obsessed with doing his duty as a guardian because he sees it as defending those who can't de uh, defend themselves and then later he's filled with guilt over what he did as a Strigoi. It's not really explored, but still, it does add some depth to him. If, if he was a couple of years younger, or even if he just wasn't Rose's teacher, I would think he was a good love interest, because, again, he's not just obsessed with main character girl, he is his own person. Lissa is not a chosen one, per se, but she is the last of a royal family, and she has these special magic powers that 
no one else has, so she's like half a step away from being a chosen one. And her journey to understanding herself was compelling. You know, it doesn't overtake the rest of the story, but it still manages to be compelling because Rose is her best friend and she wants to help her all she can, but ultimately, Lissa does need to fix her mental state alone, and that's a very good message to send. On top of that, Lissa is her own person. You know, she passes the monarchy trials on her own. She doesn't do that with help from Rose. Uh, she decides to save Dimitri and bring him back from being a Strigoi, even though Rose tells her not to. She's not just the best friend or just the sidekick. Uh, we've got Miss Carp, who isn't in this very much, but she's so afraid of losing her mind that she turned herself into a monster. And that's kind of a terrifying thought, you know? I feel awful for her, but she's also unimaginably selfish. Like, she, she's literally deciding to kill people in order to keep herself sane. And that's really dark for a fucking young adult novel. Then we have Victor, who is almost a compelling villain. You know, he wants to change society in a similar way to the heroes. He just goes too far with it, and it seems pretty clear by the end that he's also just power hungry and he's doing it for his own reasons, not because he thinks it's the right thing to do. He's in the series too little to work as a proper antagonist, but every time he shows up something big does happen, so you know, I, I will remember him. He's, he's a somewhat memorable villain. And even the teenage drama stuff managed to walk the line between being realistic and having stakes that are high enough for me to actually care about, you know? I cared about Lissa's reputation being damaged because she had severe emotional problems and that made them worse. I, I wanted her to get better. I talked a little bit about Mia earlier. She's not just a bully for the sake of it. She's a victim and she is lashing out and she becomes a better person as she grows and matures, just like real teenagers often do. And overall, I would say that Vampire Academy is substantially better than a lot of similar books, you know? Paranormal romance, particularly paranormal YA romance, isn't exactly a genre that's known for quality, so the bar is pretty low, but Vampire Academy, while it's not perfect, it does clear that bar pretty easily. There's also a few meta elements I want to discuss, though. See, there's a concept in Hollywood called twin films. Basically, two movies with very similar plots come out around the same time. This would be stuff like The Craft and Little Witches, or Ants and A Bug's Life, or Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down, or The Idea of You and A Family Affair, and so on. Like, the, this sort of thing happens a lot. There are several reasons for why twin films are a thing. You know, corporate espionage, staff get moved between studios and have similar ideas, etc. But the big one is just that they make movies based on pre-existing trends. And when they do that, we wind up with similar films. Do you remember House of Night? I covered those books years ago. Because that's also a paranormal YA series with a strong focus on romance. It's also about a teenage girl who is a vampire and goes to a special school for vampires. It also features vampires who aren't that hurt by sunlight for the most part and have magic based on the five elements, air, earth, fire, water, and spirit. There, there is also a subspecies of vampires who are evil and burn in the sun and kill those that they drink from. It also features a vampire monarch, specifically a queen, that rules over them but doesn't seem to rule over humans. It also features the protagonist dying and being brought back to life at some point. It also features the protagonist having an inappropriate relationship with one of her teachers. Vampire Academy and House of Night came out a couple months apart from one another, so they're basically twin films in book form. Now, the reason for that is that this was at an intersection of two really popular genres, magic schools and vampires. In other words, Harry Potter and Twilight, which were both, you know, still coming out in 2007. Because 2007 was the year that Eclipse, the third Twilight book, and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the final Harry Potter book, they both came out that year. And I've seen a lot of people even critic quotes like on the back of the Vampire Academy books saying, oh, this is just like Twilight, and no, it's, it's really not, you know? Like, there's vampires, but other than the vampires, it's really just a Harry Potter knockoff, or uh, maybe knockoff isn't the right word, but it's trying to tap into that same market. You know, it, it, I'm bringing this up because it annoys me when people see the most superficial elements, in this case vampires, and then just jump directly to something that's completely different. But, you know, anyways, Vampire Academy and House of Night, they are extremely similar, at least in broad strokes, and yet Vampire Academy is okay while House of Night is a 
carnival of madness that has left a permanent mark on everyone who ever read it. Don't get me wrong, I like House of Night simply because it's so bad that it becomes funny, but it is very bad. And the point I'm getting at is that it doesn't matter if the setup of the story is any good or if the concept is any good, it's almost all execution. Like, I hate when people, uh, as a criticism, they say that something had good ideas and bad execution, because that's pretty much every bad book that's ever existed. You know, a decent writer who actually cares about something can take a, quote, bad idea and turn it into something special. And say what you will about Vampire Academy, but the author pretty clearly cared about it. You know, you can't fake giving a shit. It would have been so, so easy for her to just write something out with no effort, no depth, and no character beyond the, uh, okay, there's some hot love interests and they're gonna smooch here. But she didn't. She put some effort in, and so I cared about things. I cared about Lissa's mental struggles. I cared about learning what caused her and Rose's bond and what that meant for the two of them. I cared about the election of a new queen. I cared about Rose learning to become a guardian. I cared about her running off to kill Dimitri. I cared about her trying to prove her innocence in the last book. And whatever else I can say about Vampire Academy, I'll say that. I cared. Most books that I have covered in this genre, at least, I have disliked, or in some cases, outright hated. But I just want to say that a book being young adults, or even being aimed at girls, or having a lot of romance, that's never the reason I dislike them. I dislike them because most of them have little to no effort put in. And a lot of those other books I've talked about over the years that I've disliked, all they had to do was try a little harder, use a little more imagination, and they could have been something really special. Vampire Academy did that, and it's not just a better quality book series, it was a huge success, you know? So what I'm saying is don't be afraid to break the mold. Beca and failing that, you can make the mold as good as it can be. There. That, that's my message to you. So that was stupidly long. I feel confident saying that this is going to be my longest video ever, at least so far, uh, by the time it's done. <laughs> that's gonna take a while. Uh, and if you didn't know, I try to do one of these huge videos every three months. You know, I'll do one ultra deep review and then one very brief summary. I go back and forth. So three months from now, I'm gonna do an ultra deep review. And that should be in December if all goes well, and I'm going to do that on Blue Bloods, which is also about vampires, and I've been meaning to get to it for literal years. And after that, so I guess around March, uh, will be the next very brief summary, and I'm thinking about doing that on the Waterfire Saga, because that's about mermaids who imprison demons by singing at them. It's, I don't know, it sounds weird in a fun way, but that's the plan. We'll see how things change, and that's all. I'm tired. Goodbye. Hello there, friends, and people who aren't friends but watched this far for whatever reason. Uh, thank you. Uh, all these names you see on screen here, these are my $5 and up patrons, and a special, special thanks to my $10 and up patrons, who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Ich bin Langweilig, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Mr. A5013, Pros proscriptions of Zhuo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Slumbering Jello Jellyfish, Observing Outer Space, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Bay Victus, and Wesley. Thanks to all of them. Without them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this. If you want to get your name here, then consider donating on my Patreon page. Or becoming a YouTube channel member, you can get early access to videos, as well as some other exclusive videos every month. If that sounds like fun, then go ahead. If you don't feel like doing that, you know, rate the video, comment, subscribe. That also works. I appreciate you no matter what. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye.